<laughs> so. Okay, are, are you ready? Should we start? I am good, I guess. I'm just trying to... I'm good to go. Yeah. Okay, cool. Okay, so uh, do you do you yeah. want an explanation of why or what I'm looking for or you know why we're or I, I mean I'm actually kind of interested. I have a specific use case for this. This is I so I'm uh -huh. you know here for something very specific. Um mm -hmm. but uh, uh uh, I mean, I'm, you know, obviously, I don't know whether you want to know about it or not. Yeah, sure, sure. We, we can, dis we can discuss that after, after the training, maybe if you have some questions, sure. or okay. if you okay. want to Very... share, okay. or if you want to share with me, like what you can do with Guillotina. I mean, we have done a lot of projects with Guillotina and we, we have in my company, we have very expertise in that. So, so yeah, of course, sure. Okay. So we can start. I just send you the, the training, what the, what the context, the contents, and we are go directly to the training. So there is an introduction here. And basically what explains is about Guillotina. So Guillotina basically it's a REST JSON API, right? Let's go here. Oh, um, and the main point of Guillotina is this, it's an asynchronous web server built, built with Python. It uses a sync here. So the difference is that different than Django or Flask or this kind of uh, JSON REST BI where you have uh, an amount of threads and all the requests that arrive to the server are, are, are managed by these threads. In Guillotina, we use this async here, which take advantage of the CPU bound and IO output and input, right? So we can have one thread and kind of concurrently with coroutines of Python, we can uh, answer to these requests. The other, the other characteristic of Guillotina is that it's not URL dispatch like Django or uh, Flask, where you have this URL file where you have this regex that maps to a to a view. Instead, Guillotina follow what it's called URL object. So every URL it's an object in the API. Guillotina as well have some permissions, roles, and groups which make it very secure out of the box. It's a framework that manages this permission and roles and groups. Um, and it's out of the box, you don't have to do anything and you can customize these roles and these permissions. So you can create new roles, new permissions and you know define different things, who can do what, right? And that's really important. And at the end we have content types and dynamic behavior. It means that you can define your interfaces. It's not an, an SQL model. It's just an, a schema, content type, an interface. It's really easy to, to configure, it's low code. Um, Guillotina is designed to be a framework to be low code, so you don't have to code for a lot of things that you will want in your application. Okay, so now this is not the training, right? But we are, what we are gonna do here is just install Guillotina and just run it, right? So I'm gonna do it. Um, in my terminal. I'm just gonna use the material here that there is in the training. It's the same on all that there is in my slides. So first of all, can you see my terminal here? Is it big enough? Okay. Yes, yes. So I'm gonna delete my virtual environment. I'm gonna do it from, from start. This Python program here, we will we will use it, use it later. No worries about that. So first thing, what you have to do is create your uh, virtual environment with Python, right? You do it like Python dash m, vm and gm. This is the name that you want to how to call the vm. Yeah. Then you have to source into it. Just do that, and you can check it which Python is using which in my case, it's clearly using the, the VM. And then just to install Guillotina, pip install Guillotina. If you can see this error here, it's because we have to create it. Yeah, 
we create pip and we install it with pip again. And here we go, we have Guillotina. Guillotina can be invoked with Guillotina or G, just G, right? For this tutorial, we will need cookie cutter in order to bootstrap our application to make things easy. So that's all. We have installed our Guillotina. Nothing else, nothing more. Then we jump and we'll run Guillotina just with G. You press G and now you have a web server running in your machine using a dummy file as a DB. It means that the DB is stored locally in your computer. So if you take a look at the files that you have there in the same directory where you have in Guillotina, you will find g.db, g.db blocks, right? So now if you want to play with Guillotina, just go with Postman, open Postman, and do a get in localhost 8080. You need to be sure that the basic auth that you are using here, it's root root. When you do a get, you will see the databases that you have. And you can get to the, to the database in this manner. Just the URL and the DV at the end. And that's it. You have a web server running with Pilotino. We have an option that's called profile too. We can, you can run Pilotino with text dash profile, which will show you how your code is performing, how much time some methods or some coroutines are taking uh, to be executed. It's really, it's really helpful when you have big code and when you don't know how it's, perf how it's performing. Let's proceed with the configuration now. So we, what we just have done is to, let's stop Guillotina from now. What we have done is to just run Guillotina without any config file. When you don't run it without any config file, what it does is create this dummy file DB, which in production, this is not the sweet case to do. Uh, but now we are gonna create a configuration for it. And that you use g create dash dash template equal configuration. When we do that, just press next. So what it does, it has created a config YAML, right? So if I open my config YAML, let's see. So if you open the config YAML, that's really how it looks. <laughs> Guillotina config YAML. Uh, basically it's saying, First of all, the applications that you want to install. In this case, by default, we have a catalog PG. It means that uh, the objects will be indexed on the same Postgres and we have Swagger, Swagger, that's for the docs, right? And look at this. We have a databases that's saying that we want to have a Postgres installed. We have to, we have to use Postgres. That's the mainly thing that we are gonna look at here. And we have other things like auth structures, I'm talking about it because don't look at this right now. Right now, we have course configurations, we have GT. Um, that's more or less all the things that you need to know. Now, in order to run Guillotina with this config file, what you do is G dash C and you pass the configuration YAML, right? But hey, what happens? It happens that we don't have any Postgres running, or in my case, I do. It's running here, but I'm just gonna stop it. We're gonna do it together. So now if I run it again, it says that my connection failed, right? Because I don't have any, any Postgres running. What I'm gonna do now is to start, um, to test uh, Postgres with Docker. I'm gonna send you this command here in the chat. Tell me if you if you can get it. Huh? So that's what you are saying. Run 
if you take a look here, I run Postgres with the Postgres uh, I, password. I had, I had seen all that. I tried to run the training and, and that's, I was still getting errors for that. I, it wasn't, okay, it wasn't okay. yeah, it wasn't linking. So because what happened is that one year ago, Postgres decided that it, it was mandatory to put the password here. So okay. let me let me run it in background. Do, don't do not run it in foreground. Just run it with dash D instead. Be more comfortable. Now I've got my Postgres running. And what we have to do now in order to, to connect with the Postgres is to add here Postgres, two dots, and change the DB. Because if you take a look to the DB that I just sent you, it says data instead of guillotine. So that will be the config file. That will be the right values uh, that we will use to connect to the Postgres, right? Username and password. So now, if we try again with the config, we'll see that uh, is using Postgres in order uh, as a database, right? And now if you, if you open the beaver, you can inspect the Postgres, you will see that there are some tables created there. Um, well, now it's, now it's working. So Ron, you are missing the, the username or password here. Right. And, uh, uh, right uh, database at the end. Right. So now we have, we run Guillotina using a Postgres. It's pretty easy. You, you just need to be sure what values do you have about the Postgres, write it here, and it will do the job for you. Here on my left, you can see that explains all what uh, I explained to you. And now another thing, I told you that there is Swagger here. Swagger is for documentation. So if you open your, uh, your Chrome, for instance, and you go there, localhost 8080, you put docs, you will see that automatically Guillotina creates a Swagger for you where you can inspect the schemas and the default endpoints that you have right now. You are not authorized. You have to put root root if you want to see the full of it. And here you, you, can, you can inspect basically. So out of the box, Guillotina has this swagger that can help a lot when, when you are dealing with the API. Do you have any, any questions or any objections <laughs> or something that you want to, <laughs> that you want to share with me? No, I'm still just trying to get it going. Uh, it's, Okay, J just yeah, take, I, um, I don't just could just continue. All right, I, I'll work on that. And oh, really? Okay. Yeah. So have I, you have to run the? It's, uh, well, it's okay. Uh, it's just not doing what you're saying it's supposed to do, and so obviously I made a mistake on my part. And so just go ahead and continue. But I, I, it's been a frustrating experience trying to get this thing working and linking, and 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 I've left guillotine several times because of this uh but i tried everything else and i'm kind of at wit's end uh so uh but i i'm sure i'll you know, you know some of what you've done today is good uh and helpful but you know i still have to get i have to get at least one system going with guillotine with postgres i've been able to get everything else i get postgres going i get guillotine going but getting the two working together is mm -hmm. difficult uh, so, uh, and, and there's probably some minor nuance that I'm missing, uh, and, and that's, I will find it eventually. Uh, but like I said, keep going. Don't, don't, I'll just keep at it. Okay. Have to, have to run just Postgres with Docker with the same comment. Yeah, I have, I, I have done both. I have run Postgres. I run several Postgres database, so I'm very familiar with Postgres and I have no trouble running okay. Postgres. Uh, and so I run Postgres. I run a recent version. I've run your older version through Docker. And, and, and so there's and, some nuance. And, and so I'm, I'm just, I'm, I was actually trying to get everything all set up yesterday and the day before. And, and that is the only problem that I have is getting okay. Guillotina to talk to Postgres. That is and which is, which is the error that you get? I, I get I mean, so several, it's just, it's not seeing it. It's not, uh, or the password's not right 
or, or all of that. So, I, I mean, that is the problem. So, and that's the only problem. Really, I mean, I've been doing, I, I know Alan Runyon, I've been doing uh, Plone since, mm-hmm. you know, for more than 20 years, I'm for 20 years now. Uh, you know, all of that, that, that literally is the only thing that is preventing me from using guillotina. Well, uh, this should be pretty straightforward. It and should just... be. I agree. I, and, and why, you know, on every single system I have, I, you know, I, I'm using uh, Ubuntu, all right, and, and different mm-hmm. versions. I mean, I'm on, I'm on the stable, the 20, uh, 20.04, or yeah, 20.04, and one that's 18.04, and then 21.10, and and different versions of Postgres and stuff, and and that is the biggest hurdle. Really, mm-hmm. it's it's odd. I you know. So anyway, <laughs> uh, it's it's just that that particular thing. Uh, you know, I think there's probably some stuff. I know there's some stuff in your documentation where you assume way too much, uh, and and that's and that's part that may be part of the issue yeah. right? you know you're probably not trying to insult our intelligence or whatever but there's some minor <laughs> nuance uh in there that i am just not getting so anyway i will work with it i don't want you to to interrupt no, this I mean, just for me but it's fun we have we have just time and i and i don't know do well, i don't want to i need a uh, I don't want to mess it up for her so i mean this is my no everything everything's fine everything's just uh, do let you let let him help you. <laughs> okay, all right. You just wanna... a second. I'm gonna. Uh... Share, um, I'm share using. Your screen. Um, I'm yes. using Ubuntu two, so I don't know if I will run into um, similar questions. So I guess it, it's oh, good if, we, if you yeah. can. We are all using Ubuntu. I'm using Ubuntu as well. Right. Yeah. I mean, I've got, yeah. So I've got. So share, share, share your screen. Yeah, and I can. I can. I mean, I, yeah, I, okay, hold on. There's too many things going on. Um, so, I mean, I've got Postgres running, all right? So that's all well and good. Uh, and now I've got to go in, I'm trying to, I just go in and I've got, just a second. If you show it to me, just run, it will be better. I'm just, okay, I'm, I'm just trying to set up. The, <laughs> I, I had a whole, okay, I was, you were flying through. And so I was just actually going through and setting up just to be clear, you know, okay. a whole environment. All right. Uh, I'm just trying to activate it. And, and that is just really weird. Uh, okay. No, no worries. If you, well, if you it, share okay, screen, I, okay, yeah, screw the virtual environment. All right, uh, I already have <laughs> it. I already have uh, Postgres running. Um, I need to go in. All right. Um, there was a gcreate command that you had. Yeah. You know all this by heart, all right? And so for those of us who don't know these <laughs> commands off the top of our head, this is a little difficult. All right, you had a gcreate. If you could go back to your gcreate command. Okay, but if you share the screen. I, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on. All right, I, I, I'm just working through the, just a second. I need to use. Is it not? It's it's difficult for me yeah, to understand exactly. what's going on. Um, okay, you can. That is not it. Uh, actually, no. Okay, hold on. I've got way too many screens up. Um, shit. Okay, yeah, that, that's really slow. Yeah, it's noise. not helping you and it's not helping me. Okay. Uh, I'm so just going to get out of it here. Uh, if you want, I can do it again and yeah, go really slow. Step by great. step. Just, yeah, just as yeah, I, mean, I got tried it and I, I'm working with Zoom. I, I, wish, I, I will share my screen. Uh, right. Again. 
Okay. Yeah. Good. Thank and you. I, I and I will do it again. No worries. It's fine. Okay. Okay. So, let's go to the previous topic. All right. Right. Uh, let's go to the previous topic of installing guillotine. I've already got that. That's already done. That YouTube okay. is working, it runs, I got cookie cutter, that all is absolutely fine. Okay, so I prefer to use virtual, virtual environments. Right, right? I, I, I'm having, yeah, I, so I, I actually so, have a machine dedicated to this and that's here. So I, I, I don't even need that. So, but if you want to go do that, that's fine too. Okay, so I just source into it, all right? And if I do a which, which Python, for instance, I know that it's using my virtual environment, okay? Now, from here, you say that you have installed Guillotina and Cookie Cutter, right? Uh, yes. Okay, I will remove my, my config file again. And this is the command that you have to run. Right, that's it. That's the one. Gcreate, right? What happened when you just press intro? Equals configuration. Uh, no Craig is shown. Path YAML. Yes. So it's got. Uh, so I've got the config.yaml file. Okay. Okay. Now, this is the config.yaml that you have, and I have. This has to be the same. Right. Right. Yeah. That that looks familiar. Right. It had guillotine at the end instead of data. Yeah. So now that I I, I write that Postgres two points Postgres. Okay. Just a second. I got to pull it up. Uh, I'm sorry. Right. Okay. And you have to go in and do yeah Postgres. Uh, okay, so it, so the, what's missing on my config file is it's mine supposed to look like yours because it yeah, does. Yeah, yeah, just okay. the same. Uh, it doesn't have the Postgres colon in front of Postgres at localhost. Yeah, just just write it the same as me because that's okay. telling that the, the username is Postgres, the password is Postgres. It's running okay. in the, in the localhost in the port five four three two. Right, four, and then slash data, and then. I would like you to to check if you have some Postgres running that sure. you said that you have one, right? right just just yeah. just stop, stop the the, doc, the Docker container that you have running. Now, okay. what may happen is that you have a Postgres running locally in the port five four three two. That is correct. Yes. That okay. So we are gonna do another thing instead. We are gonna run Postgres. We are going to run the Docker, right? This yes. same command that I just sent you, but instead of saying 5432, we are going to write another port, like 45434, OK? And I'm going to run this. OK, hold on. You got uh, just a second. I'm, I'm going to do it again. Yeah, no, no, no. I just... And I'm going to run it on background with detach. So now I have Postgres running and it's exposing the port 5434. Then I'm going to go to my config file and change this port. Okay. Yeah. Um, in your, I, just, just in your documentation, can you like explicate all of this so that it's, I mean, because when people, they're not going to just run it on Docker. I mean, they're they're going to have like a Postgres. I mean, I, this yeah, is something. Then, yeah, this is something you, where the the, the documentation yeah, sure. really needs some work. Yeah, yeah, sure. What what you have to take into account here is that this name here is the username, and this this one is the password. Right, so but right. That will but, depend on your configuration that you have on, on Postgres. Absolutely, but that that's the stuff that needs to be explicated. That's that's not right, and and so yeah, I I just that one last that one little part I think 
if mm -hmm. I know you don't want to okay. insult people and I, I go out for that, but for someone <laughs> who's just like, yeah, yeah, I mean, because I don't have, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, I, I understand. I, I, um, I will write that down and and put it in the in the docs for sure. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, that's so, that was just the only little, little thing. <laughs> So now it, it should work with my configuration. And now it's working because I know that my Postgres is running on port 5434, exposing that port. I know that the username is Postgres and the password is Postgres and it's running locally. So as you can see now, it's, it's working. And you, you should see this, the same thing. Okay. But you just have to run this document. Right, right, yeah. Just, uh... I can write it down in the chat. No, 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 that's okay. I think actually. You got it? Okay. Oh, just a second. Yeah. Okay. So, well, the database is showing blank rather than. But that's my problem. Well, it should have. Just... In the database, when you get, when you get a signal back, um, it's not showing me any databases, but it's, it's not showing necessarily a connection. I mean, is there a separate thing that shows the connection for the database? Well, if you want to see the database, I use the, the viewer. Okay. I'm looking at to the database. What, right. So I can do this. I can open the viewer. I'm sorry because it's gonna. Sure, no, go ahead. It's not gonna look so, so big because I cannot do that bigger. But uh, if I go here, I go to Postgres, play next, localhost, the port is, is different. It's one by four, username, Postgres. I test the connection, it says that it's okay, finish. Then if I go here, I can see the Postgres and I can see the schemas that they are, PG catalog, public, uh, all the tables that are here. And of course they are empty because we, we haven't created anything yet, but the connection is working. So it's it's all fine. Okay. We have this PG catalog that yeah, there are tables here. Because by default we have the application PG catalog, which aggregates some tables. That's correct. So uh, that's correct. My the guillotine is just in Postgres and it's all going fine. Have you achieved that? I, I'm <laughs> okay. What's happened is I had to go jump off onto a different machine. I had a machine that was all set up and, and, and I've left it. All right. In order to get, so I could share the screen and, and be with you and stuff. And so literally I'm recreating an entire environment on the fly. So, you know, it, and I'm done, I'm downloading Postman. I'm, I'm getting that whole machine all set up. So I apologize. I'm sorry. Oh, no worries. No worries. Right? It's fine. I, I, I'm it's fine. literally doing everything from scratch on the fly. So <laughs> I, I and, will give and, you some time. No worries. Right. That's good. So, and I don't want to mess with, I don't, I want you to continue on. I mean, I, I hope that you will, because okay. I don't want to waste time just because of my setup. All right. So no, no worries. Uh, Janina, are you, are you trying that? Um, yeah. Um, I have just finished with, uh, I had some problems with my uh, VENF um, um, mm -hmm. and now I have a Docker runs, um, mm -hmm. but I have a password authentication failed for user Postgres and I don't know why. Yeah. If you take a look to that. Maybe I just. Uh, no, that, that, that's because Postgres changed their policy and now you have to pass a password and this documentation needs to be fixed. So in the chat, if you take a look to the chat, I just send a message with the document. Yeah, I used runner. that. You, you used that? I so, used that. So, so you can run Postgres. The error is not in the Postgres, right? Yeah, I, I run. OK, now he says, uh, OK, one second. So um, now he says uh, he, 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 he runs, so. Database okay, system so is ready to accept connections. Okay, perfect. So now you have to go to the config file and add this Postgres here because the config file, it's not taking into account the password. So 
your config file should look exactly like mine. Instead of the three four, you will have a two here because you're exposing the yeah. three four to two four. So you have to write Postgres like that, and then just okay. try to run Guillotina again. Okay, I'll try. Uh, and I guess I have to use uh, data at the end. No. Excuse me, I didn't. I didn't Sorry. hear you that well. Um, at the end of the DSN, uh, DSN, yes. Uh, there is data, and uh, in my yeah. config there was a uh, retina. So. Yeah, because if you take a look to the Docker command that just, I just sent you, it creates database. And it's called data instead of people. Yeah. I mean you you can change one or the other. Yep, yeah, it's run it, it it runs. Okay. So now if one it's it's running, you can go to Postman and you can get into it. And you have to use the authorization basic out root root and you will be like the maximum uh, um, user in the system. The manager. Yeah, you will be the manager. So if you get into it, you should see that there are some databases available, which are DB. And that's all. We don't have anything else in our in our API. Okay, uh, anonymous user. Yeah, uh, you are not authorized to access this content. Oh, you, you have you have it running? Yeah. Uh, well, it says yeah. So it it gave yeah. Uh, yeah it says reason you, you are not authorized to access this content, but it did give me a database. Yeah. It didn't give you any databases, right? Well, it uh, if if you just look at the regular one, like the. This after eighty eighty slash yeah it says database and then there was you know an empty set yeah the, that's was... because you need you need to use the basic out here in the authorization headers oh right yes of course duh uh, yes uh... that's root root right All right, yeah, container and then type database, right. Okay, I think okay. I'm in. Perfect, Finally. yes. Sorry. So Guillotina is running with Postgres. It was not yes. that difficult at the end. <laughs> well, yeah, once you know all the winks and nods. <laughs> okay, so now we are in the same level. Let's proceed. So now we have learned about the configuration of Guillotina, right? I mean, we now have to configure that or database is here by using this config YAML that we have and the DSN here. So we can configure different different databases here. Imagine that we have multiple, you want to have two, so you just have to define another one. Instead of DB, you can call it data. Okay. Let's proceed. Let's proceed. Just the next, oh wait. Next topic, we have started Guillotina. We have configured Guillotina. So we are gonna use the Guillotina API. Now we are gonna create some content into it, okay? Through Postman, right? Yeah, through Postman, through Postman. So as I explained before, 
guillotine, it's a URL object mapping, right? So as you can see here, you have the DB. So the, the father of, of everything, apart from the DB, is the container. So we, we need to have a container. So in order to do that, we post, we choose the body here, and we write this type. We said we want to create a container. And we said that the ID of this container must be container. Then we can add some extra data like title. So now if you are root, you post and you have created, we have created the first container. And because it's hierarchical, the URL, you can get into it and you can say container and you can get into it. Now, I will give you some time and just um, speak loud if you don't know how to do it or if you have some problems. Um, I have the same problem um, as, uh, oh God, I'm so bad with names, I'm so Ron. sorry. Ron, Ron <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, as Ron that I have uh, the message, if I get into the browser, I get the message, you are not authorized. Um, but I couldn't follow the, the steps um, to fix okay. it. <laughs> okay, so Sorry. You, need, you need, no, no, no worries, it's, it's just fine. You need to be authenticated, right? Yeah. So we use basic auth, but you have to do it with Postman. It's, it's easier than with the, with the browser. So do you have Postman, Janina? Uh, yeah, I installed it, so I guess I should have it. Okay, so I recommend you to open it. It's really useful. Once you have it open, you need to write the, the write the URL. Go to authorization, go to basic auth, and write root root. Yeah, it's 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 opening. I never never used Postman before, so. Yep, Postman, okay, Postman is really cool. Yeah, it is. It's really useful. Okay, Ron, now he says I have to to create an account. Uh, no, you, you don't have to. At the bottom, there's a little thing that ah, says go straight to yeah. app. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. found they're, it. Great. They're trying to sell it to you, but it's not. Yeah, they, yeah. There's yeah. They're being a little too clever by half. <laughs> So I guess I will, will uh, oh gosh. Yeah, you, just, um, you write the URL and. Well, you gotta do the post first and then the, then the get. Yeah, Ron, have you made the post? Have you created uh, the container? Yeah, I've already done the post. I'm already where you are. Okay, perfect, perfect. Uh, do so do, do I, sorry, do I, have to do a new and 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 then a HTTP request or no you so really environment? No, you don't have to create any environment. You can you can create any request that you want here. Just in the top left, there is a plus sign. You just click it here and you can enter the URL that you want. Ah, yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, in this case, is is localhost eighty eighty and. You can see here that, that just below get, you can see the params and authorization. So just click in authorization, go to yep. basic auth, choose basic auth and put root root. And just get, get into it. Can you see the databases as me? Yeah. Okay, perfect. So then you write DB here in the URL. See, it's yeah. it's all like a tree. The URL is like a tree, right? You navigate, yeah. into, that's called traversal, right? So now what you have to do, Yanina, is to create your first content. Con you need a container. That's the father of everything, right? So what you have yeah. to do is to post, go to body, and you have to type something like this. The first it's type because you want to create the container. So that's, mm -hmm. that's type. Then the ID must be container. You can put the ID that you want, but for the sake of this training, 
just write container and the, the title is optional you can just put it or not now you can have multiple containers though can't you yeah of course yeah you can you can have a container too if you want right if, if you were making a clone site this is this is where you would make it i mean i mean that that's yeah. are you familiar with yanina are you familiar with clone right yeah Right, so this is kind of the equivalent of making your phone site, I think, isn't it? Exactly. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Guillotina is based on Plone. I mean, it's different, right. but Ramon and Nathan are, they have been working to, with Plone a lot of time. So if you do a post, then it will create the, the container. And if you do it and it's already created, you will have 409 with the conflict because the ID. Another interesting thing is that if you don't put any ID, the ID will be randomly generated. Oh, really? That's a neat thing. Yeah, I, I don't know if the container does it, but for the other objects, yes. I believe it will do it. Let's try it. No, the ID is required for the container. It's okay. the only That it's is the only as object. it should be. Otherwise, you'd yeah. have no idea how to get at it. Yeah, exactly. You have to name it container too. Have you cre have you created your first container, Yanina? I guess so. Yeah, perfect, perfect. So now it's all traversal. It's like a tree. So if you get into the container, you will see the some information here. You will see your own container. You can get into it, and now we we can create more content inside of the container. And for instance, what I'm gonna create now it's a folder. So it's post again to create content. The ID can be can be empty if you want to create it empty. I'm gonna say full folder and I'm gonna say my first folder. That's the title. I post into it and the folder will be created. And again, if you wanna access the folder, just get into it. And you have the folder. And you can do that over and over if you want. Now, what I'm going to create inside of the folder is an item. Because folder can hold items. Items cannot hold anything else. I'm going to say it for item. My first item. And again. I have created another item, an item inside of the folder. Now you didn't Can have you to, see? okay, wait, is it contextual? Because you had to be in the folder before you could create the item, could you not? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because if not, the traversal does not know where to create the content. So you right. post and you get inside of the context. Right, but... Uh... Right. Okay. But I mean, so when you're in Postman, though, I mean, like you did item, but how did you, is it, how did you know that it was going to end up in the foo folder? Because I'm, I'm doing a post in the foo folder. That's the. Oh, I see. Uh, okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. Through the U. It, so context is through the URL. Exactly. That's the magic of Guillotina that uses traversal and URL to map all the objects. That means that every URL is specific. It's unique. Uh, right? So, so right, and so if the if the folder didn't exist, you get an error message, correct? Of course, of course. Yeah, so instance, okay. So if I do that and I do get or do a post, that will not work. Right. Because it's not found. It's a four four oh four. Right. And that's cool about Guillotine. That traversal URL, uh, unique thing that maps objects. It's it's really helpful. And the same if you want to delete content, just delete, go to the folder, to the context that you want to delete, and delete the folder. Then all the items inside will not exist. Is it like the concept of Unix, where you have files inside inside folders, <coughs> right? Where you delete folder and all the files 
are processed to be deleted in the future. This is the same with Guillotino. So you can create hierarchical data structures by using this method and this, this API. So, so basically, uh, you can have any kind of uh, uh, property within that object, just define it when you create the object? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so... We can have subscribers, we can have endpoints. That's what, what we are going to see. In this, okay, in this are you going to go over like how to have templates for certain types of beyond just item? Yeah. Or yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we're going to create our own kind of, of objects. In this case, we're going to create conversations that inside they have messages and we're going to create this, this type of objects. And we're going to do more things, not only that. Okay, so... Um, get to get things, post to create things, delete to delete things, and batch to modify things. It really is. If you go, if you go here, here is. Where are the slides? It just disappeared. Okay. So it's easy, right? Get to get content, post to create new content, patch to modify content, and delete to delete content in the URL as, as we uh, trips in. Then we can do more interesting things, not just create and get. We can use behaviors. Now, we are going to use a behavior to use an attachment to upload things in an item, right? I'm going to show you how, how we can do that. Guillotina, by default, have some behaviors that can be uh, patched into a single object. For instance, I'm going to create another folder. Okay, I'm going to create. I'm going to say that that's a folder. I'm going to say that that's a full folder. My first folder. Let's create a folder. Okay, now let's create an item inside of the folder. Right? We write item here. We write foo folder in the URL. You misspelled folder, by the way. Yeah, thank you. Foo, that's item. No worries. I'm gonna take that into account. And that's my first item. And I misspelled that, so I could delete it. Huh? I mean, yeah, well, yeah, you just take another one. So I have full item here. And what I'm gonna do here, something like that. I'm gonna add a new behavior. The behaviors, what they do is to add new attributes to the object. So if you do that, then go here. I'm just I'm just gonna copy from the web page, right? I'm just gonna copy that. Put it here. Just have to delete that. Yeah. Okay, let's let's patch the full item. Okay, so now the full item contains a new field, a new attribute that's called file, and we will see it if we get into it. You will see that has a new behavior here at the end. That's attachment, I attachment with the with the file new, and now we are gonna upload some files to this file, to this attribute here, to this full item. So in order to do that, we are going to do, we are going to call the endpoint upload. OK? So the semantic says, OK, I wanted to upload something inside of the full item. That's going to be in the attribute file. So now what you do, instead of JSON, you choose a binary. I have chosen an MP3, for instance. You just navigate to your to your um, documents and grab one and do a, I think it's a post or patch. It's a patch and do a patch. It will say, okay, so the file has been uploaded. Now, if you get into the file, you will see that the behavior now it's full. You see that the file contains a file name, contains the content type, which is an audio, the size, the extension and the empty file. So the, the designation of the content type was automatic, correct? Excuse me? 
the designation of the content type was automatic. Is that correct? Yeah, it's, it's all automatic. Yeah. You don't have to do anything. So same way, if you want to download it, just instead of upload, download, and you do file and you do a get. And now you have the song here. So now for the sake of this test, only in this tutorial, this file, it's saved in the Postgres in the blog. That's, that should not be correct in a, in a production environment. On Monday, I will explain how we can use gcloud instead of Postgres in a low code map. Have you achieved that? Have you tried that to upload a file in, a, in an item? I was I was just watching you actually. I getting right now. Okay. Now that I got the connection, I can do all this. I mean, I'm just watching you do it. This is this is really helpful. Okay, okay. So uh, basically, what we have here it's some behaviors that by default Guillotina has some behaviors defined where we can attach them to different but objects. Can you can you kind of explain a little more fully about what you mean by behavior? I mean, I, it looks like yeah. Well, uh, I mean, it looks to me like the behavior is based on the file type on what you do with it by default. Is that correct? Not, not really. The behavior by itself has some attributes. In this case, this behavior has an attribute that's called file. Just only that. So it's like kind of tune an object. So imagine that you have an object and you want to tune it in a special way. You want to have some special behavior. You want to have some another attribute. It's not part of the object itself, but it's part of the behavior that you are designated this object. So okay. at the end, what you do is when you apply a behavior to an object, what you are doing is extending that object. You are adding another attribute to this object, right? In this case, we are adding the I att e attachment, I attachment behavior that tune the object by adding this new field, it's called file. So that's what a behavior does. Let's imagine that you have some objects from that structure objects and you have some specific behavior. So I don't know, imagine that you have the object person or human, but then you have some different kind of behaviors that I don't know, a human can be a teacher. So maybe you would like to have a behavior with this new teacher that will add these new attributes to this object. So in this case, we have this behavior that is called I attachment that Lutina has it by default, but you can, you can uh, add it to another object. And what explains here is how to upload files and how to download files. This is what I've done. Guillotina as well support tools that it's uploading objects by chunks. Uh, Janina, can you lower your volume a little bit? There is a, uh, there is a lot of uh, noise. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so uh, Guillotina uh, allows tools, which uh, it allows to upload chunks. So you can make resumable downloads and uploads. Upload, sorry. Which is really helpful. We just have to pass the headers to use resumable and the offset. This is just to follow the protocol with the TUS. And it says that we can upload files too without knowing the, the size. Because sometimes you're generating files on the fly you are generating uh, a big file by chunks, so and you want to upload it at the same time, so you don't have, you don't have, and you don't know this, the total size of the file. So that's that's really useful for large large files. Okay, now I'm going to explain you about permissions. Permissions plays uh, a big role in Guillotina. So um, it's like Plone, right? Plone knows about permissions and roles. It's pretty secure. Uh, it's pretty solid. Uh, Guillotina uh, is that as well. Let's go to the example I just created. Let's go to the full item. There is this design point that's called sharing. Sharing will show you the permissions and security of that objects and the roles. So, Let's take a look to the payload here after calling the, the share. So we have the permissions that are locally in this item here. And it's saying there are three kinds of permissions. There are role permissions, there are principal permissions, and there are principal role permission. Okay. The first one says 
this role have these permissions. The second says this principal, which is the user, is the ID of the user, has these permissions. And the second one says this principal has these roles. In this case, root created the full item because I was basic, I was using basic alpha as root root, right? So the permission of this object of root is that he's the owner, it has a role that it's the owner. By default, Guillotina gives a principal that has created an object the role of owner. And this role here has multiple permissions, like accessing the file, build the file, delete the file, move the file, modify the file. It has a set of permissions, right? So that's why I can access this object because I have permission to access it. Root has permissions to access this, this, uh, this object. Instead, in Guillotina, we have inherit permissions because imagine that that the permission of the folder change. Imagine that someone says, okay, your root cannot access anything that it's inside the folder. Then it inherits the permissions of the folder and depending on the permissions of the folder, it will be able to see the item or not. Now, what I'm gonna do, just to, sh just to show you how this works for the sake of, of this example, I'm gonna change the permissions of this object. There, there is an example on the same web on the same web page. If you have any question, just just shoot up. So, what I'm gonna say is that the role guillotina owner does not have the permission to access this file, right? So, what I do is to change the role. And I will say that the role is guillotina.owner. And I will say that the permission is view content. And I will put deny. That means that the role guillotina owner in this object will not have the permission to build this this item here. So I do a pause here. It's, it says, okay, and now what will happen when I get this? Oh, I cannot access this item because I have changed the permission of this role. So the root has not access to this, to this file. Is it, <laughs> it is it's curious and, right. and weird, yeah. right? Because that way you could, you could uh, block yourself from access your files but I still have access to share, to change the permissions because there is a permission that allows you to change the permissions, right? And that's so good. So now what happened? Yeah, of course. So now if we do a sharing, I initially the permission, what will happen here is that we'll say, okay, the role guillotina owner for this specific object does not have the permission to build content, right? That's why I cannot access this content. If I change it again, I can do an allow. I can change it again by allowing. I will explain you the different types of settings that we have. So if I allow it again, now I'm gonna be able to access the file again, right? And I could do the same thing for the folder. And imagine that there are 10 items inside of the folder. If I change the permission to the folder, then I'm not gonna be able to access any of the, item, of the items inside, right? So that, that is just an example. And here, it explains you what you can do. So it explains you what the principal permissions are, explains you what the principal roles are, explains you what the role permissions are. So Guillotina allows to just change the permission for a specific user, which is the principal. Guillotina allows you as well to change the principal, the role of the principal. So imagine that you have one user and you want to add you want to give access to this role, to this, this principle, to this role. And the last one, it's that you can change the permissions of the role of the object instead. Now, there are four kinds of settings where I just, when I just write, in, write this in settings here, you have four different types. You have allow, that means that the children will inherit. It means that if you change the permissions 
in the father of the folder, all the children will, will inherit that permissions. When I, when I say all, I mean all. Everything that is that it's behind the URL will have this kind of permission. You have deny. That's the same than allow, but instead it deny it. Okay. Then you have allow single. It's allow single is the same than allow, but the children will not inherit. It means that it's it not it doesn't get propagated among all the other objects that are behind the URL. Right. And and, and so if because it's because it's allow signal single. It's only for that specific object. So if there, yeah. if you add a folder, it will inherit from it, like skip an inheritance essentially. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Exactly. And and set when set you remove the setting, you just remove it. So you have this this four here, and with this four we have the security. Um, we have a strong security because we have this triangle about that that um, this relationship with principles roles and permissions. And with this triangle, we, we can build a uh, very solid security using just guillotine out of the box. I mean, you don't have to do anything. You can define your own customizations of the security of the objects. Um, and you can do it specifically for, for one object, or you can do it in a more general way. Right. Well, I, does the granularity of the objects kind of mirror what's in Plone and Zope? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Exactly. 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 Ramon and Nathan plan to do that the same than, than in, in Plone, but in Guillotina, in Python asynchronous code. That's good, by the way. That's very good. It, I mean, that, that kind of granularity is really important. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is. It is. It'll, it helps a lot with the projects that we have a lot of uh, complicated security, security, um, security functionalities and use cases, use cases. And it, it works pretty well. So um, that, will, that will be all for the chat here. Okay, so now we've seen so far from these points, we have seen the first five points, right? We know what guillotine is, that it's a JSON REST API that follows a hierarchical URL structure that maps objects, unique objects. We know how to install Guillotina. We know how to start Guillotina. We know how to config Guillotina to use Postgres. And we have learned about how to create content, how to delete content, and how to patch content. Besides, we know what behaviors are. Behaviors add specific attributes to the object. And basically now we are missing the point six and the chat application. I don't know if you want to take a break. I don't know if, if it's fine for you before we start the Asyncu and chat application or if you should just continue and go on. I'm good. Go ahead and continue as far as I'm concerned. But Hanina is... Yeah. I'm good too. You you too. Okay, let's proceed. So, so now we are going to take about Asyncu, right? I don't know if you have heard about Asyncu before. Python, the, the Python library. Well, Python Asynchronous library, basically what allows you is to run coroutines in an event loop. It means that you can run, you can run concurrent code in Python using coroutines. It's not, it's not multi-processing. It's not a threat. It's just coroutines, right? But in Python. So Guillotina is built on top of that. So, I it explain here, like Pyramid, Flask, and Plone. So it processes X threads by the total number of concurrent connections that can be handled at once. So if you have five threads and you have um, 100 concurrent connections, there will be five threads that could be taking all the job, right? So with the Syncio, instead, what we do is um, we do not block the code when we do a network connection for instance, web client, web server, app server. I mean, we don't have to wait for it. So in a Syncio, when if we use, uh, when you do a get, for instance, that take five seconds, we, we can wait for it. And at the same time while it's waiting, it will run another keratin, right? So it, it gives you kind of this feeling that it's multi-processing, but it's not multi-processing. There are concurrent that is running keratins. And it uses the await and a sync syntax. 
that and that uh, another language is used as well. So there are some examples here. And then I'm, I'm just gonna show, I'm just gonna jump over the code. I'm just gonna show you how, how it works, right? So in a way to define a coroutine in Python, you write a sync just in front of death, right? So this is a coroutine. And in order to run it, you import the sync here and you async your run and you run the method. This is really simple. This will print high, okay? Let's jump to another more complex example here. We have two hellos here, two keratins. Excuse me, we have three keratins. And what it does here, it creates two futures. What means it creates two futures? It means that, can you see here that we have an asleep of, of half second here? It awaits. So this program, what it will do first, it will print high one because we have created this task here that run concurrently with future two. Okay, then the hello one will await, will sleep. Now in normal Python, if you do a sleep here, it, it will block all your code. Your call with your code will stop here. And after this half and a five seconds, it will continue. But with this syntax and await, what it will do is will print high two. So we will print before high one, high two, we'll wait for enough, uh, half second and we'll print, we'll print high one. So it's not blocking. So imagine that instead of sleeping here, what we do, it's a get request. So it's a post that has a syntax of await that uses some library that is compatible with the sync here. So you are not gonna be bound by the AO output or CPU out, uh, bound here. That's what it's creating here. In this case, this will run concurrent here. And this await, what it's saying is like, okay, let's be sure that it that finish. Let, I'm gonna block here, but at the same time, these two, these two coroutines will run. Let's see another example now. This is how, how a sync can be used to, long, uh, to uh, run long running task. Same thing, uh, we create a task, right? And we wait for 10 seconds. In this case, it will wait. And after we waited 10 seconds, it will cancel. You have, you have a while through here. So this just is to demonstrate that you can run coroutines that, that last a long time. Here, more examples. Well, all the examples follow the same rule, right? just to show you how to, um, how to run uh, asynchronous, asynchronous code in Python. Here we have a more uh, visible example. We have the async gather that does more or less the same than create task. So here, can you see that we have this AOHTTP client session that it's in, an, in a context, asynchronous content here in Python. So what it does with this await here, basically it's not blocking code. So this download here will happen all at the same time, kind of at the same time. It will give you the impression, the illusion that it's multiprocessing, but actually what it does, it's like when it arrives here at the wait, it, it will execute another one, another, another keratin, right? So it's not blocking. So this will download all uh, kind of all in one. It gives you this illusion and we, we can test it if you want. I'm just gonna write this this code here. Sample the time. Just gonna write this code. I'm just gonna stop the guillotine. Blockman. Oops. Sleep. I got to install IRTTP. Can you see that, that we have download, that you have made the request, like we, we, didn't, we didn't have to wait for it. I mean, it's not, it's, not, uh, it's kind of parallel, right? But it's not, what, what it does, it's execute coroutines 
um, jump over the carotene in the event loop. What it does is jump over the carotenes and execute them. It sees that there's not a carotene that gets awake, right? So this is the, this is guillotina it's built upon, upon that, it's using a sync here. It means that we don't, we don't need 10 threads in order to, um, to manage this 10, re 10 requests. So it's gonna jump over, over the request that the server is receiving and attending them. It's really important that, that our code is asynchronous because if it's not asynchronous, it, it will block. Imagine here that instead of AUHTTP, we have, we have the other famous um, request library to make this request. So the code will block, will wait for the input output of the network. And yeah, it says that we can create loops. We, we can create um, iterations, asynchronous yieldings here. Here it says that if you have some code, imagine that you have some code that it's not uh, made in based in, in a sync queue. Can you see here? We are seeing a request get URL. So that will block our code. So a sync queue has this running executor that what it does, it has a pool of threads here and it makes your code synchronous to be asynchronous, to be async, right? And it's because we are using running executor. And what, what we are saying is that we have a thread pool of executors. We have five, five workers here. And we said, okay, I'm gonna run this function here inside of our executor. And this magically will be an asynchronous. It's better to have code that it's non-async to run it in an executor than to have code that it's synchronous and block the code and block the whole, the whole uh, server that we have. So that's why we have this run in execute. This is for you to illustrate you the, the different ways that, that we can use a sync queue. Uh, sync queue. And a sync queue offers, of course, another subprocess model that it's really neat. I've tested that myself. I've, I've been playing with it and, and it, really, it really works. So that's the basic of, of a sync queue library in Python. That's how Billotina it's, it's built. It uses a synchronous code in order to, um, to create data, to access data of the database. I mean, all the code tries to be asynchronous. That's the difference with Plano, which it's not, uh, which is, oh, uh, it's synchronous. Okay. So that will be the end of these seven, of these six chapters here, right? I've given you an introduction of Guillotina. Um, I've explained you a sync here, and now we are gonna do the chat application, right? Now we are gonna do our first application. Let's jump into it. Do you have any questions, excuse me? No, that was, that was good. I mean, it just reinforces one of the reasons why I was interested in Guillotine in the first place yeah. was the async IO. Yeah, yeah. That was, that exactly. was very important for the application. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So now we're gonna talk all the application, right? Um, I'm gonna go to the same directory I was. Okay, I'm just gonna delete the config I had before. You could do the same than me. To just, you can just leave the VM, the, the virtual environment, okay? Cool. And now what we are gonna do is- You don't, wait, you don't have to stop, you, you're running instance of guillotine in order to do that, right? I mean, you just go and <laughs> it's asynchronous, it. if you will. What do you mean? If I change something in the code? Well, no, 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 what I mean, yeah, no, what I mean is that, uh, I mean, by running that, you, you got, you had your configuration. So you got your YAML file 
your config.yaml mm -hmm. file, right? But you don't need to stop Guillotina to create the template for the application. You just keep running Guillotina. It, it just runs it in a separate thread, correct? I mean, some in some cases, like some frameworks, you, if you're going to go do something like what, like create the template, uh, the application template, you have to stop the instance. You don't mm -hmm. have to do that with Guillotina, correct? No, no, you don't. You don't have to do that. Right. But it's all in memory. So you have to create that at the um, the template. You have to run this command here, and we are gonna call it Guillotina Chat. It's not the full name is not mandatory to call it Guillotina Chat. You can call it whatever you want. Neither the email, but here you have to call it Guillotina Chat. So now it has created for us, this command has created this Guillotina chat module here. You see the into it and you install it in a development, in the development uh, way, like that. Eh? Okay, install. Okay, there. I think that I'm, li I'm listening to you. Uh, I, yeah, so it, no, it wasn't anything on my background, but okay. Uh, no, there's a new member in the yeah, it's Roger, it's Roger He's the one that's going to be the, the training of tomorrow of Guillotina React. Okay, have you done that? Have you? Have you installed the new model that we just created? So by doing this pip install here, what we do is the it's to install the, the model in the development um, in the development way. That means that if we change the code, automatically it's gonna we don't have to do another pip install. Have you done that? With the yeah, I, I've done it. Yeah, I, I've already gone through and uh, I just, the, what's the pip in, on the dash E? Yeah, that means that you are installing. So you see my screen. Can you see that we have a setup here? We have a setup oh, right, in, okay. the same, yeah, in the same right. directory. Yeah, yep. so when you do a pip install dash e, what it does is like installing it in a, in a development way. That means that if you change the files that are inside of the module of your application, you don't have to do another pip install. Automatically, it will install it for you. Okay. So now if I do a pip list, I can search here and I can see that we have, I have Guillotina chat installed. So I'm, I'm just gonna, jump to the configuration. What it says here, well, we all know that. We know that we can configure Guillotina with the config YAML, right? But we have other ways to do that as well. We can use object, Python object in order to do that as well. And this is the object here. This app settings will contain all the config of the all applications that we have in the system. In our Guillotina. This page is just, just to, to, to show you how to do it using Python. Let's jump to the content tags. Let's jump to the let's um, jump to the beef. I, can yeah. I can I ask a question that I, yeah, sure. I since we just did async IO, uh, mm -hmm. a question I have is how much memory and such, I mean, is there any kind of gauge on on how much memory all of this stuff takes? So if we were making a virtual server, you kind of know what you need to do what you need to have. I mean, you need to have mm -hmm. a quad you know, quad core processor with 16 gig of RAM or, or how do you gauge no, that? Of course, what happens here is that Python only uses one thread, right? So it, it couldn't make that sense to run Guillotina in a machine that has more than one core because no, it's not gonna use more than one core because Python only use one core. What you can use then in order to scale, it, to scale Guillotina, what you do is run workers as well. That's what we do. So I'm you, sorry, you run what? Workers. So you workers, run five, okay. 
Yeah, yeah. You can run five heliotinas if you want at the same time. Then you will need at the maximum cores that you will need. It's five cores. Okay. Right? In terms of memory, it depends on the application. Uh, if you want to check how much memory you're consuming, you can run Kilotina with profile. As I said at the beginning, dash dash profile. Now you will see how, how much memory you're consuming, how much memory your processes are consuming and how much CPU uh, is consuming as well and the time that it's taking. Okay, good. All right, thank you. You're welcome. So let's cut through the cheese. Now we are going to create our application, right? Um, you have to copy that. You have to copy all this code here. And we are going to create our first application. And you have to do it. You have to, um, to copy it inside of the Guillotina chat. In the Guillotina chat, where there is an API file, an install file, and test the uh, folder. Um, you create a file that's called content and you paste it, you paste it. So at the end, we have that, we have that file. Excuse me, because I would die buffer. Yeah. Let me just delete that. Don't we need that code that was from, you know, previously from the previous screen? No, no, this is the first, this is the, the code of before it just showed you how you can manage the configuration using a Python object. Oh, so oh, now, okay, now, I get it. Okay, right. Yeah, so okay. now this code that we have here, I'm gonna go line by line and explain what it's doing. Because here what we are, it's defining our objects and content types, right? This is like kind of plum thing. It follows the same rules, okay? But in a different way. So let's look at, the, at this class here. This class is called iConversation. And it's giving you a hint because of the i here at the beginning, that this is the interface. This is the schema that we are using for objects. In this case, conversation will have users, which is a list of integers of text. Right? Nothing else. That's all. This field here, that's called index field, what it does is index data into the catalog. In this case, we are using Postgres, and it will index as a JSONB on the database so we, we can search. Just, just for you to know, but don't take that. I mean, the important part is that one. So this is the interface. It's really easy. Just a field that's called users. That's a list of strings. Now, let's take a look to the content type of the conversation. We are naming our content type conversation. We are using the schema e-conversation that we just defined above. We are using the behaviors. Do you remember before that I told you about the, about the behaviors? So we are saying, okay, now by default, this conversation will have this behavior. That this behavior includes title, includes description, modification date, creation date, Include some basic information that's kind of metadata. So, so and the Dublin, so so Guillotina does not assume any default behavior. So even for even for Dublin Core, you have to add it. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. You you have to add it here on the creation, on the definition of the content type. You need to add it here, and then we said, okay, this kind of object will ha will have the allowed types that, that are inside. They are messages. It means that inside of the conversations, there will be messages, okay? Okay, one, one, we, one, one, one kind of quick question, I'm sorry. So you have, yeah. a, you have a list there, right? And so you could have mm -hmm. multiple behaviors, correct? Yeah, exactly. Okay, how does call, Guillotina, you, well, I mean, does Guillotina kind of either detect or how does it handle when two behaviors conflict or, or overlap? Well, they, they, they never conflict or overlap because if they have the same field, they are named the same. It's in the, it doesn't matter because it's another behavior. Oh, well, but it's up to the developer to make sure that there is no conflict between the behaviors, right? Because Dublin Core has some behavior, some things for some fields, right? Mm -hmm. Title and description. Uh, yeah. And right. So if a different 
behavior somehow said, well, for my description, I want this behavior that yes. conflicts with Dublin Core, the developer yes. would have to make sure that that doesn't happen, correct? Yeah, but it will never conflict. And let, and let me show you why, with, with, with an example. Do you remember the, the full item that we had here that we just created? Right. Yeah. So if we get, if we get, oh, I just, I just, um, wait, because guillotine is not running. Well, now it's not working because I don't have the connection, but I, I um, you you shut it off a while ago. Yeah. yeah. My Docker is running, right? Yeah. It's because of the config. It's the same thing than before. See, remember that we have to change that. Right. So we have to change the database, right? Yeah. Now it's now it's correct. Now uh, <laughs> I'm really that was worth the price of admission was that little tidbit right there. It was really important. Yeah. So now I have my Pilotina running again, right? Right. So if I get the item, I'm going to show you why it cannot collide. Okay. Because take a look at that. Here you have the Dublin core. Right. And, and inside of the Dublin core, you have all the fields that define the, the behavior. Right. Right. And right. look at look at the I attachment here. You have the field that's that's called file, but it's inside the E attachment. If the developer decides that wants to create a file that's called description and add it into this behavior, it will not conflict because the field will be inside of the behavior. Does it make sense? Uh, the field will what the behavior? So we have two behaviors here. Right? right. Yes. We have guillotine at Dublin core and we have I attachment, right? Right. So imagine that we define another behavior that has the field description as Dublin core has already, right? Mm -hmm. It will never collide because this field will be inside of the behavior. It's not part of the object. It's part of the behavior. So oh, oh, okay. Do you, do you understand right. what I mean? Okay, yeah, now I get it. Okay, that's interesting. Okay, very good. Okay, I yeah. get it. So so you, you can have the same fields, but at the end, they, they are apart from the behavior. They are not part of the object. It's part of the object itself. Right, so, it's so the object the is, okay, so the object never stores, or the behavior no. is never inculcated okay. or incorporated into the object. Not really. Okay, yeah, so yes and no. Yes and no. I can say you yes and no because there are different kinds of behaviors. There are annotations behaviors and there are context behavior. Annotations behaviors are saved in another. In an, it's a, it's a different object in the in the database. Imagine okay. that you have a big behavior when you or I don't know. You can save subtitles. Imagine that you have an object in Pilotina that's called video that can have subtitles, and you have this behavior. So you want this object in a different part, but in this, yeah. It's kind of attaching. It's kind of the same object. This these behaviors right now. Okay. Okay. So yeah, that's why they never collide. They will never collide here. So if we go to the content again, see, can you see that conversation has inherited from folder? That means that conversation itself will have all the fields that the folder has. And see here that e conversation inherits from i folder as well, right? So we are kind of extending a folder, and by creating conversations, right? Mm -hmm. And now let's take a look. Let's take a look to the message. It's the same, but in this case, message it inherits from item. It creates a field that called text. The field it's text. See, that's a big text. Text line, it's a short text. Text, it's a big text. Okay, and take a look at the content type here. The type is message, the schema is I message, and the behaviors, there are two, Dublin core and I attachment. So by default, the message will have these two behaviors. Right? That's right, yeah, that's very it good. Makes sense, right? Because the message will can include attachments, right? right? And you can create your custom behaviors if you want. You can define them, you can define the fields, and you can include them. And you can include them here, like it's generally speaking, all the object will have this behavior, or you can go to the API and say, hey, this, this object 
has this behavior specifically. So we have this dynamic behavior and static behavior. That's a static behavior because all these objects will have this behavior. And we have this dynamic behavior where we can add it as we did before with the endpoint behaviors and add it the same object. So that will be all. That will be uh, the definition of our content types of conversations and messages. Okay. Now, in order to guillotine and know that this that this module has been added, we need to we need to add it into the init file. There's an init file in the same project where you can scan the, the models. And you have to do here, it's to write content because that's the name of the model that, ju that we just created. Didn't I just save it? Yeah, no, I saved it. So now let's test it out. I'm gonna do the same. I'm gonna run Guillotina. All right, I'm gonna go to Postman here and what I'm going to do is create a conversation. Remember, to create content, always a post, yeah. right? To create a kind of object, it's, it's called type. And then we name it conversation with the ID for, you, you can leave it blank, the idea. And it could randomly generate it. And we can define users. I'm just going to make them up. See, it's created. So now I can get to the conversation. And now I have the conversation here created. Let's do something else. Let's create a message inside of the conversation. Let's call it full message. And instead of users, it has text. And I just created the message here. And I can create the messages that I want. If I remove the ID, I could create them as many as I want. Okay. So now if we get into the conversation, you will see at the end that there are all these messages here. This, this sh should uh, um, seem you familiar with Plon because the, the API shows uh, in the same way. So well, what's the, to, okay, in the ID, oh, so the ID has some like hash value or something attached to it? Yeah. Can you see that I created? Yeah, I see it. Yeah, I, I see it there. Right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Exactly. So uh, is that the actual, uh, so that's, there's a GUID associated with every object, right? A, U, a universal I identifier. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. And, that's, that's, that's not the, the well, part of that is after the thing is is part of that URL. Yeah. So yeah, part of it, but it's not the UID. So the UID identifies the object in the whole database, right? This right. ID, this ID is just the um, the mapping of the URL of the object, right? And this right. is unique. So, right. This is unique it, in this it, context. It, it, right, and it is unique, right? And so yeah. if, now, if you but move, it is, if but it is unique. Object, well, all right, but if you move the object, like in Plone, if mm -hmm. you move the object, it will remember how to get at it, even though you moved it. Yeah. How does it, does it work the same way in Guillotina? Yeah. Yeah, okay. there exists the move, the move endpoint and you can move objects. Okay, so so if you if you wanted to reference another object in one object, you would store that, uh, the thing, the 93C0, <laughs> all that other stuff, right? Well, yeah, exactly. You could do that, or you could map the UID. Well, if you map the there UID, there are two difference. If you map right, but if you map the UID, you're getting the whole. If you if you change if you move 
an object from one can one folder to another folder, you're going to change the yeah UID. I, I like these questions because because uh, we have faced that in the we we faced that in in one of our projects where we save the ID, right? And what right. happens that the client the client wants to change the location of the right file. exactly yes and the so, clients do that yeah so instead of just saving the id what you have to save is the uid that never change okay that here never change so okay. if you want to reference your object um you need to save the uid okay instead of the of the, the url UID, right uuid yeah exactly rather than yeah. url yeah Exactly. I mean, you could do both. And if you are really sure that it's never changed, never going to change, you can risk to it, but it's risky. Well, yeah, it's risky, but also from a performance standpoint, which is quicker? It's quicker the async get. It's quicker to get this instead of the UID, but they are both perform really well. Okay. So Guillotina has multiple utilities and utils, utils that, that allows you to get an object by the UID or the or if you are in the same context in the code, you can get the ID directly. If you have the ID and you're in the same code and you're in context, then this is faster. But they are they are both, they perform really well both. So okay. I prefer to save the UUID, to have the UUIDs and to be, to be able to refer to the object anywhere. Right, it's independent of, of context. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All right, now, uh... Okay, so if I was looking for context, though, I would look through the URL to parse out the context. Exactly. See, right. this is the magic of Filotina. Every URL maps to an object, right? So right. if you want to go to the folder, you just go to the folder, right? Now, now I'm going to show you um, another interesting thing that Filotina has out of the box with Postgres. I told you before that we have this index field users, right? And that we are using Postgres. We could use Elasticsearch to index things too. That's one of the things I'm gonna explain on Monday, how to integrate Elasticsearch. But for the sake of the, of the testing here, I'm gonna use Postgres. So a really interesting thing is that out of the box, Guillotina has this search endpoint here. Well, all the data is indexed in the Postgres. It's indexed in the Postgres. And you can see that I made a search and it returned me all the objects that I had here. I had in the same full conversations, right? I have eight items in total here. If I search on the context of container, it will return me all the object I have now in the system. I have 11. And we can do, I, we can do really interesting oh, things okay. here. That's all the objects in the container, right? So this yeah. is right. Yeah. And we can search and we can search for for context as well so if i search in the folder it will return me only the elements of the folder how do i call it i don't remember uh fo oh because you spelled it for conversation that's right focal. yeah yeah i spell it yeah so and another interesting thing we can do here see i can search in the container and i can do some filters like time name like right. okay I just wanna. I just want the conversations that I have. Thanks, Javier. So I can search for time name. You don't have to put it in quote. No. Okay. Can you see? It only yeah, I one. see it. Yeah. So and if I search for a message, kind of uh, spell it here. It returns me all the messages I have, which are eight. Right. So that's really. And that's out of the box. And you can do more complicated things. For instance, you can do title, like you can do in, like my. This is like saying, okay, if the word MI it's inside of the title, then return me, right? Right. Well, it's just that character string and not a <coughs> unique. Can you uh, can you add like some Boolean logic to that? Yeah, it's more complicated and that but, yeah, you can do but you can. because no, no, you can, you, you can add here more. So but by doing, by writing that down and I don't know, and said description, you're right. saying that's, that's an end, right? I right. Mean, it's not that easy, but you, you could, you could do that. You could do that. So.
So out of the box, Guillotina includes this search that it's really useful because you don't need to do anything else. You just have indexed, all your data is indexed in Postgres as a JSONB and it, it can be searchable. And you, and you can search uh, by using content types, using IDs. You can search, for instance, you can search by ID. So I remember I misspelled it before. Uh, I grabbed that, right? Right, yeah. So I have one, right? So yeah. you can search, you, in a, you have the ability to search out of the box. You don't have to do anything. Right, but uh, so let me, I just want to, one last question. So when you search, let's say like you're in the container, search ID equals fold, yeah. you know, fold, Foldler, uh, that gives you all the objects, not only the objects, not only the object of the folder, but all of the object that the folder contains, correct? No, in that case, it only gives me the it only gives me the ID that I requested. That's that's the folder. Okay. Just this object. Right. So it, it limited, but if you're let's just say that uh, you know, so it only gives you that folder object, not the items that are contained within the folder. Exactly. If you want to do that, there are multiple ways to do that. You can search into the same. You you can search uh, inside of the um, of the for of the of the context. Right. If you do that, then yes, it will return you all the things that are inside the folder. Or you could do things more uh, more difficult, like that. You could you could do some wildcard. I don't remember. You could say, okay, the file wildcard, something like that, and it will say container. Cool. I think that that will return everything that is inside of the folder. Okay. Well, okay, so, but if you wanted, if you wanted to return the folder and it's no, no, you couldn't it, do. It, 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 yeah, you you could uh, you could you could do that, but you have then you have to play with the with, with the, the URL, request. right? The, the request. request, yeah. So if you want that, what you just said, you could set something like um, you can search by path. Can, can you see the path here? Yeah. That you you have you have the path, so you could do something like that. You could say path, path. Okay. Yeah. Wildcard. I don't know if in Postgres that's allowed because I'm really useful. I'm really used to work with Elasticsearch instead of with Postgres. Yeah. Right. But you could do something like that. Full, folder, and then like this. Right. That should that should work. Well, or actually, if you do the instead of the slash, see that'll give you the objects oh. in foo folder rather than foo folder and the objects. Yeah, that will give me at the end. It will give me all the path that contains this this wildcard here. Right, right. But can you do like a folder and take out that last slash, that slash, last fold, folder? Because what I'm looking for is, can you get ideally? Can you get the folder and its contents. You want the folder and the contents. You could you could do that. You could okay. do that, but you have to maybe um, right, like just like that something that relates. Yeah, right. Right. Yeah, yeah. I, I would use I would use the path like this because right. that okay. will return you. Yeah. Okay. Now it's not it's not working here with Postgres because I'm not used to work with Postgres with the catalog. We will we will see how the wildcard works, but yes, you could. We do in our project. We do something like that. Okay. Because if you have a string, basically what you want is to query to query it. Yeah. So you will do something like that. That's another thing that's beautiful from Guillotina. That's out of the box. You can you can search. So we have tested out. We have created conversations and messages. Now, oh, uh, I see that Janina is not there. Ron, um, uh, I'm going to take a should, break. I, yeah, you want to take a break? Yeah, let's let, let's take a short break. Okay. Should we see each other uh, 55? I'm going to be uh, there. I'm just going to I'm just going to, to the toilet and I'm going to come back. Okay. Very good.
We're taking a break until uh, 55 minutes after the hour. Diana? Yeah, I have to go. I have a visitor here uh, and. Um, oh, you're going have to, have to jump. Huh? Are you coming back? Uh, I don't I don't think so, because it's just an hour. So I have to go. OK. All right. Well, it's very nice meeting you. Yeah, uh, hopefully we will have the uh, the pleasure to meet again in uh, tomorrow in the in the tutorial or uh, maybe uh, during the conference. Yes, very good. Auf Wiedersehen. Auf Wiedersehen. I'm here. You, you are mute, Ron. Yeah, there we go. Yalina had to leave. Okay. I'm sorry, it's just me. Oh, no, no. <laughs> Run, so you, you can learn more about Guillotina. Yes. This is this has been great. You, I mean, just <laughs> being able to link it to Postgres was like a big deal. I'm sorry, but <laughs> that was like, I was really frustrated. I'm sorry. No, no worries. It's fine. These things happen. These things happen. So ha have you done that? Have you tried to create the conversations? Have you well, well actually, I, actually, I started my own app. Uh, just to kind of explain where I'm coming from uh, and, and kind of my history, uh, Alan Runyon, you know Alan Runyon? No. Oh, he's the guy who invented Plone. He and Alexander Limmy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So have you ever heard of a guy named Trace Siever? No. Okay. Well, you heard of Zope, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, use, Trace was one of the original employees of uh, Digital Creations, which was part, then became Zope Corporation. Well, Zope Corporation became Digital Creations. Anyway, Trace Siever and I uh, were in Houston, Texas, U.S., uh, and we knew each other because we worked with the same software program called Delphi, which was made by Borland and for Object Pascal. And then uh, Trace turned me on to Python. And this was in the late 90s, <laughs> OK? And then uh, so I needed to know more about Python. And there was a user group run by Alan Runyon. And Alan, so that's how I met Alan Runyon. And at the time he was working on Plone, the very, very, the very beginning of Plone. And so I knew Alan and he actually on my Apple laptop got Plone running on my Apple laptop. And then I was off and running because I also knew uh, Paul Everett uh, because of the ZODB. Mm -hmm. And so uh, in law, Law does not lend its law is about relations. And so believe it or not, 
uh, law does not lend itself well to relational databases. It actually works best with object databases and in particular hierarchical object databases. And so that's mm -hmm. what led me to, uh, well, first a thing called Gemstone and then ultimately to the ZODB and then Zope. So I was mm -hmm. doing Zope stuff uh, back in the late nineties. And then uh, I met Alan and then he did Plone and I thought, oh, this is exactly what lawyers need. And so, in fact, I was one of the speakers at the very first Plone conference. Mm -hmm. so, that, so that's how long I've been at it. Yeah, because it's really robust with security. Right, right, yes. And, and, and also the ability to do it through the web because I, at the time I was with that multinational uh, law firm based in Munich. And, mm -hmm. and so we had to have, we had offices in the US, in Italy and Germany. And so we had to be able to uh, cor uh, corroborate and, and ha the hierarchy in, uh, lends itself very much to the workflow and all uh, because uh, law is very hierarchical but there are relationships between within different hierarchies. And so mm -hmm. for me, um, the, I have experimented with like GraphDB, NetworkX, things like that, trying to make a graph network for ontologies because literally law is a group of ontologies. Are you familiar with ontologies? No. Okay, well, ontology is a hierarchy. So you have law, then you have business law, then you have contracts, mm -hmm. then you have clauses within contracts, yes. right? Okay, and then uh, you, have, uh, you have laws among jurisdictions. So you have the United States, you have Texas, you have counties within Texas, and you have courts within the counties, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and then you have, you know, clients within the counties and, and different counties and things like that. And so you create a set of hierarchies where law applies to certain sets of the ontology, but not all parts. And so, and then you have 2 million plus decisions from courts in various parts of the country. And they're all, I, I don't know, if, are you familiar with uh, graph, uh, graph terminology, nodes and edges? Yeah. Okay, so, yeah, right. So one node would be a, a court opinion part of the relationship, an edge would be between the judge who wrote the opinion and the uh, opinion itself. And then there'd be one from the opinion to the category of law to which the opinion pertains. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah, and so guillotina, since it's hierarchical, you know, you would store the data in the hierarchy of the court system, right? Supreme Court, Court of Appeals, District Court, things like that. Uh, mm -hmm. And then you'd have links to the different, you have edges between the different nodes. And so mm -hmm. when you hit the judge, you get all the judge's opinions, where the judge is located, what jurisdiction the judge has, that type of stuff, directly mm -hmm. from the context of the object. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Though guillotine, it's not graph oriented, like right, right. Three. So what you would do is you would you would use a separate objects for the links or the for the edges. Yeah, or you the objects the would, be, would correspond to the nodes. Yeah, or you say that, that's why I was asking that if you could if you return if you return all of the objects, so you return the uh, the folder. There's going to be a folder for a judge, right? And mm -hmm. and there are going to be links to all the opinions that the judge wrote. Mm -hmm. But we do that. We we do that by by querying to the path, as as I said as I said before, as I did before. And what we used to do is yeah, query the path. And if you want to search in a in a given context and you want all this context, you just go to the same context and do the query from, right. from, and, from and, there. And that would work the same way as a collection would in Plone. Yeah. Right, you just set, you would set the collection so that, but really what I would need is that I would need an object. So within the folder, there would be an, well, see, this is the thing. I guess I'd have to use Elasticsearch because the, the link object, the edge object actually would contain, contain uh, the UUID for both nodes. 
Mm -hmm. Well, what we do here in some projects is to index, da index data from other objects into the same object, into the other object. So we have something that's called index with directives. That what we do is, for instance, take one object, what, what you were saying, look at, this, at the other object and index the data for that object. So you don't have to look all these objects. So you only look one that relates to another one and index all the data in that object. That will be well, a solution. Also. Could the UUID be part of the index? Yeah, it could be part of part of the index. It could be part of the index, and and the index can be indexed in this in this object if you want. Well, I mean, is the index kind of like XML, where you can add metadata to the index item? Do you mean the index in Elasticsearch? Well, yeah. See, I mean, ultimately, what I would need to know is when I'm in an object, I need to know all the objects that that object is referenced, either referenced by yeah, or yeah, you references. Can do that. You can do that by querying by the UUID, for instance. So right, that's what I mean, yeah. So, so, so you would, so when you create, when you create a link between the two, you would just add the UUID. But, but the thing is, this is the kicker. Uh, the, you would have a link, but you need to know why you have a link. And so there would be some metadata associated with the link. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what you can do here is, for instance, from what I'm saying is that you can create a behavior that do that for you. You can create oh. a behavior that says, okay, this object has this kind of behavior that has this kind of UUID with metadata, right? So you can have a list of IDs or a dictionary diction, or a dic of IDs and then of the metadata of this UUID if you need it. Or on the okay. other hand, you could index the data of, of, in the same object because when you are creating an object or, or when we are modifying an object, we have the the ability to trigger some events and when you trigger these events you could index some data into the same object so when you are querying it like by the endpoint search you will you will all the information will be re returned to you so you can have this information of the other nodes or or leaves or whatever you, you call it okay so so if another object gets created that references a first an earlier object that mm -hmm. could be a trigger for an update yeah. to the catalog. Okay, of yeah. that original, yeah. ob the earlier object. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Exactly. You say, you say, when this object is modified, I want to trigger this, this directive that's here. And then you're going to say, okay, give me the object by this UUID. You get the object from, from the database, you get its, its attributes or the data that you want to save, and you index it. So it's, it's indexed in the same object. It's indexed in the same object, and you don't have to search for the other object. You just okay. search that so and you have all the information of the other objects right. just on the is, same is, object. Is that in Postgres or Elasticsearch? You can do it in both, but okay. I recommend using Elasticsearch maybe. Okay. If if there is a lot of data and you have to to search for a lot of things and the queries are complicated, I recommend I recommend Elasticsearch. Okay. And we have parsers. So we have default parsers by PG catalog and Elasticsearch. What does that mean? It means that if you, if we create a query, we have a default parser that will that will parse all the all the parameters in the in the URL. or will transform it to a query valid in the Elasticsearch, right? Okay. That that's, that it's done automatically. But if you want to do more complicated queries, like we do in more projects, we just build our own parser, our own uh, query factory or query builder to query Elasticsearch just for the thing that you want. Yeah. OK, thank you. Yeah, so if you want, we can, we can continue. Yes, please. Um, yeah, by so the now, way, I really appreciate all of this. I mean, this is this is oh. wonderful. This is, this is hey, worth cool. <laughs> I'm really happy, so <laughs> I'm really happy. So we can continue by explaining that Guillotina can have add-ons, right? Add-ons, it's an application or a Python package that can be installed and that's something, right? Has some logic in it. Okay. For instance, let's define that add-on here. Let's copy that into the same content. That's an add-on. And what this add-on does, first of all, do you remember when we do the sharing with the post and we change the, the sharings? We can do that on the code. So that's what we are doing here with this Arrow Permission Manager. 
like so we are saying that the container that the role guillotina member in the container will have the guillotina access content so in other words all the users that have the role guillotina member will have access to the to the container let's continue what's saying here this is a keratin all right and it's saying if the container contains the the folder contains the conversations id this is a sync container it's like saying if there is something in the container if it does not contain the conversation it creates a folder that's called conversations and then it gives permission to this folder conversations to the role guillotina member to add content and to access content so what's going to happen here when we install that add-on what we are going to do is to change the sharing of the container it will allow the guillotina member to access it it will create the folder of conversations and it will add this permission to the folder conversation then in the uninstall here you will add your logic here that for instance i will say that the logic that it's missing here it will be that when it's uninstalled okay you mm -hmm. have to do one, one sync del of the conversation folder the install create the com the folder and the uninstall deletes the folder and we have to do here it's to change the permission as well so we'll do something like that so is it, it is that normal where we have to go in and, and use so that's so you actually have to so the async io aspect mm -hmm. even though it's built it's built into it you still have to declare it as an async io function yeah because if not you you, you wouldn't know if that's a coroutine or not right so you're right so it's essentially it's not async by default you have to ask for it mm -hmm. exactly is it by if you def, if you define it by a sync if that's a key routine right let's do some let, let's do something stupid okay so okay. imagine that i let, let, let's let's just do so imagine that i want um get for a sync def uh test i don't know let's write something like that cls here and i do something like sleep this is just pseudo code okay right and then print i don't know i'm just doing this is a key routine but it does not contain any await sentence here so that will block that will block all the execution of the code that sleep here it's going to stop all the server here because that's even though that's a key routine there is not a sync your code inside okay right yes am i explaining myself i think so, so. If, if you do that and now imagine that we do something a little bit different instead of using time sleep here imagine that we use the build on sync your sleep that oh. yes that, okay. that make then that makes sense because it will not stop the whole server here because you have an await here imagine that there there are another keratins going on with right. the awake here, then it will execute that while, while this waits, right? So right. if you define a core routine, but you don't have um, a synchronous code inside, it's useless. Doesn't do anything. That that, that makes sense, right? Right. Yes. Just I just, I didn't realize that you had to go in and do that by default, essentially. Yeah, you have to, because if not, if if you define like this, why why would you not this, want to do that? Because because maybe imagine that you are calculating uh, medians of a large object. Imagine that you have a large list, large list, something like like that. Right. right? So and you do and you do like right. this for in for in uh, I don't know. I'm just doing pseudo code huh? for in branch, and you just large list dot append. Right. And I don't know. I imagine that you do the sum now of the large list, right? right? That will consume a lot of time, and that's synchronous code. What I will do is put it in, putting that in an exec, in running an executor. Right. I will run that in an executor. So if I if I do that something like that, like main or run, call it whatever you want. 
I will say that async you get running loop. I will capture the loop and I will say loop run in execution. And that will be asynchronous, synchronous code, something like that. You will, you will do none and then you will just do that. Then this test will be executed synchronous, but it's fake. It's kind of fake because you have a thread pull here by using that. That's what I will do in that case. That's similar than, than the code I had here. Could be a sync queue. Yeah, I don't know if you can see it. Maybe it's a little mm -hmm. bit. But when you run in, in an execution, all these requests that get that it's synchronous, all this download URL here, it's synchronous. Right, right. Yeah. Well, it would be, yeah. So instead, in this example, what it does, it's run it in an executor. And what it does, it uses a thread pool executor with, with threads, actually, and it does the job. It's kind of a sync queue. Mm -hmm. It gives you the chance to do that. But that's only the case that you have really CPU bound code or that you have like kind of this thing. Or if you are serializing, for instance, And here I will do something like inside permission to roll, something like that. Let's say that's cool. Let me just set a syntax checker. Okay, so now we have this add-on here. Let me just put that on the top. So we can install this add-on here. And what it's gonna do, it will create this new folder and set these new permissions. So again, I stop the Latina, I start it. I go to Postman here, and what you do is add-ons, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, so your body has to tell the the ID that if you check a look, it's Guillotina Chat. The name of the add-on is Guillotina Chat. We, we just define it with this with this um, decorator here, your config add-on. So we need to install this add-on. Okay. Now to do that. Okay. ID, get in a chat. And I think that's a patch. Not found, it means that's a post. And that's yeah, okay. Cause... It's okay, right? So we just installed this add-on. And now if you take a look here, now that should have created a folder that's called conversations. And yes, it exists. Right. And if you do a sharing, we should see that, as we said before, now the role guillotina member has add content and access content in this in this folder. This is what this add-on has done. Is the piece of code that it's here. This piece of code. Okay. By this, you are saying, okay, in this context, which is conversation because we have created here the, the folder and that's, that's the result, that's the object in memory. Right. So we said, okay, I want to grant to this object, to the role, add content. And member, access content. So, yeah, so if you wanted to have an add-on that, uh, that added essentially conversation capability, you just run mm -hmm. that add-on, it create a folder, you'd have a create a folder, lay yeah. everything out, the interface, mm -hmm. the views, everything, right? Yes. 
you don't have right. to worry about that if you have an add-on that, that does that for you. It will do the job. It's and useful. populated with efficient. objects if necessary. Yeah, yeah, of course, you can create more objects if you want. You can create five folders or whatever you want. You are, you are free to go here. You can do whatever you want. See, you have the context here on the install. You have the container. So here in the container, you can go through the traversal. You can go, you can get, for instance, another folder that you know it's there and go inside that folder and create folder inside folders if you want or whatever. You are, you are free. That depends on the on the application that you want to build. It's cool. Yes. So you would just create the add-on. It says that it's fine. Now permissions and roles. We all know about that. We have we talk about this a lot. And let's copy that because we can define new roles and permissions to that role. I prefer to create it. It says that put it in the init file, but I prefer to add it in a new file that's called permissions. It's already there because I did the training myself. Okay, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. No longer exist. Yes, no exist. We check, yes. So just to explain the code that is here, what we are doing here is to configure a new role. This role, its name, Guillotina, chat conversation participant. Then what we are doing is to grant this role with permissions, with view content, access content, and add content. So we have this new role with these permissions. Now I have to go to the init and put it here. Because if not, the guillotina doesn't know that this file exists and it's not going to work. Right, load. yeah. You always have to do that if you add another, another module. Now, let's go to a really interesting topic here. Subscribers. Subscribers are events that triggers a method. Okay? Okay. I'm going to copy that and I'm going to show it in my Emacs. Okay. Subscribers dot by <laughs> it's already great. Let's delete that. <clears throat> Let's copy it all. Okay. That's um, it should be conversation. Just the name. Eh? Okay, what what's happening here? We are defining subscribers for the context e conversation. And it says, when, this when you add a new conversation, this method will be triggered. In other words, when you post and create a conversation, this method will be triggered here. Same if the conversation is modified. So at the end, when a conversation is added or when a conversation is modified, this method will be executed. All right? And what? What does it do? First of all, it gets the authenticated user that is making the, the request. In our case, it's root. So user ID will be root. And it's saying, if user ID, it's not in the conversation users, add it, append it to the, to the field. Remember that in conversation, we had users, a list of users. So it's adding it. Then what it's saying is like, okay, I want to modify the permissions of the principles of the of the role that has this principle and it's saying okay for every user that is in the conversation i'm gonna give it the role guillotina conversation participant that's the role that we defined earlier so in other words the principal root in this case will have the role guillotina conversation participant that this role has the has the permissions to access content, add content, and view content. So what we are doing here is that when one user creates a conversation or modify it automatically, we are adding the user to the user's field, and we are giving permissions to this user to add more content to this conversation. Right. Right? 
That's right. And, 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 and so, well, I mean, alternatively, you create the folder to have certain roles and assign the user to that role. And then the, to be, you know, the permissions go with that role. I mean, is that yeah. another way to do it or? Yeah, you have this triangle. So you have, you can have, you can have principles to have roles. You can have principles to have directly permissions, right? Or you have, you can have uh, permissions to the roles directly. You have this triangle, like like in Plonic, you and you can play play out with this triangle, mm -hmm. right? Yep. So we need to add that again to the confuse scan. That was called subscribers. Right? Subscribers. Okay. Yeah. Subscribers. Okay, so now we can test it out. Now, hold it. That the file that you have yeah. in Emacs, the one that from Guillotina import configure, that's for Guillotina as a whole, or just for that particular application? Which file? The Which one file? that's I... in Emacs right now that you have in your Emacs that I see on the screen right there to the that, right. That one. That one, no, right? That's for Guillotina. That's the init file of Guillotina. Right. Because here can you see these app settings here this is the app settings that i was talking before and you can right. define here your custom application settings via python right Yama. you just have to have that uh wherever that's where you that's with the code that you have for your add-in correct yeah you, right. you can add custom configuration here using python right so imagine that you have some environment variable that you want to use so you, you could use it here, for instance. You could do a lot of things. You could do whatever the Python allows you to do here. Right. Yes. So now, if we test it, so we go to the conversation here, to the conversation folder, and we can create a conversation. So what we do, it's like always, type. Which type were we creating? In this case, it's conversation now we have the id we can call it for conversation and we are not gonna add any users here all right just post it and now if you get to the full uh, conversation and you do a get you will see here that the users contain root because the, the subscriber has triggered and has added that for, for us. And if we check the sharing, the permissions that we have here, you can see that the root now has the role guillotina chat conversation participant. Right. right. So that's subscribers. That's a really powerful tool. And that's something that we use in our projects a lot. They are really necessary. That's yeah. I, uh, that's wild. Okay. Okay. Now let's go to the users because now we are playing it with root. That that's not interesting. We are using the tests only with root. Now Guillotina out of the box package to manage and store users and groups. That means that out of the box, Guillotina offers a login and offers a way to create new users. And for that. You can guess it. We have an add-on that's called DB users. Um, a quick question. Can you have yeah. custom code for the authentication? Yeah, you can. Okay. Um, you can. Okay. How would that work? Okay. So the way that works is that you have your config here. Can you see that you have this out extractors in the out talking right. validators yes. here? Okay. So you, you can add your own here and you can add your identifiers and you can create your own. You just have to inherit from the interface that's defined in principles. Okay. And you can create your own login method. Okay. Identifier. We do that in some projects as well at this group. Yeah. So out of the box, what Guillotina offers you, it's it's a really way, it's a really, it's a really nice way to manage users, to create users and to login. And that's an, an add-on. 
So in order to install this add-on, we should do like before, but with this ID, with, with DB users. So that's out of the box. We just needs to install it. So add-on post, we'll delete that. And we install DB users. Oh, oh, yeah, because I have to add it to the application. Oh, all right, okay. Of course. And this code can be, I mean, it's here. It's in the guillotina GitHub. Okay. I mean, just, so if you go here, mm -hmm. you copy that here. Can you see that's guillotina.contrib.debeusers? So right. here you can go to guillotina, you can go to contrib. Contrib is can, up Yeah, there. Right. And you have DB users here. DB users, yep. And we have said before, you have this install here, which is the add-on. This should oh, is okay. also yeah, hey, to you. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> you see it? Yeah. So you have this add-on. And what is doing this add-on? Well, basically, it's creating a container. It's creating users. It's creating users and it's creating groups. It's not doing much, right? Mm -hmm. Then it gives you more things than that. There's more things like an adapters. See, we have permissions as well. That sounds you familiar as well because we have added some uh, custom permissions which Guillotina, which dev users add permissions. See? Mm -hmm. That's, it's interesting because you see that it's really familiar on what we are doing, but it's already done. So, so now that we have added the application here, we run Guillotina again, we go to Postman and we post and that's okay, it worked. So now users, they will just one, folder that's called users, it's here, and all the users will be here. And the users here will be the principles that we have been talking all this time. So in order to create a user, what we do, it's a post in the user folder with this payload. In this case, the type is user because Guillotina, right. the users define the, the type user. Right, and, and that email. almost becomes like a reserved word now. Which Excuse is me? fine, yeah. Yeah, I mean, now you have or, to- You have to, right, yeah, that's, that's okay, that's fine. I, the yeah. only, I, I guess, is there a way to find out what all the types are in the Guillotina system? Yes, yes, you, you can search in Swagger, for instance. Okay. You can search in Swagger and you're gonna, you're gonna find there. And there is one endpoint that gives you two, but I don't remember now. We'll have to look into the, the, the documentation, but yeah, I don't know if it's a schemas. I don't know if it's a schema. A schemas, schemas. Schemas, no. yeah. I don't. I don't remember the endpoint, but they, they exist. They right. Exist. I don't remember right now. I, I will have to search. Now, if you but get, now, yeah. If you get to, uh, so it's, I mean, because of the add-ons and such. You know, you can run in the situation where you have two types with the same name, and I presume that Guillotina would see that trying yeah. to, and then flag an error. Yeah, it will not allow you to create another contract. Right. Type. Okay. They, they because that would mess up the other uh, the existing objects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that will collide. Right. <laughs> I'm okay. pretty sure. So now we, we can create this user Bob. That's called Bob. We just name Bob Secret. And you want to specify the roles that the user has. In this case, Guillotina member. So just post, and we have the user. <clears throat> so now we can log in. Automatically, we can log in. And what we do, it's just delete that. Username and password.
and we post. post. Yeah. And can you see here that we have a token? Yep. So now, if you want to be Bob, just take the token here, copy it, go to the authorization, and use it as a bearer. Right. You paste it here. Right. Or if you wanted to send it to a separate OAuth or something like that. Well, that, that's not OAuth, but, but okay. yeah, this bearer. I mean, with this, you are Bob. And can you see that you cannot access the container? Because right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's actually, yes. Hey. Yeah. Bob. It, Bob cannot access the container. Right. But what Bob can do. What Bob, what Bob can do is create a conversation. Can't see it, because but can, a, yeah. Yeah. Because this is a guillotine member. So we just go to body and do the same thing. Just type. We do. Conversation and ID, and we do Bob conversation, right? Yep, and it's created, yeah, because and Bob, yeah. right? Yeah, and Bob now, can uh, access. Where would the owner be? Uh, <laughs> I, I, okay, let's play that. What do you think it's the owner? Of well, Bob I conversation? would think it would be Bob, wouldn't it? Exactly, exactly. Bob has the roles of right. the owner. Why? Because it has created the content. Right. And because of the subscriber, Bob has the permission and has the role of conversation participant. Right. And remember that the role conversation participant allows the user to add content and to build content. Right. Yes. So if you try to access another conversation. You won't be able to, at least as Bob. It's Bob. And authorized. Right. Because you haven't created that conversation. You are not root anymore. We are Bob. This is this is really powerful. Yeah. No, this is this is really it's very predictable if you are familiar with Plong. Exactly. It follows the same rules. Right. You follow the same rules. So yeah, login, bearer, that's what we have seen right now. We can jam to the serialized content. Now, Guillotina, they ha it has its own ser serializer, which you can modify if you want. So when you get an object, it, the object gets serialized, right? You, we can modify that to have it different. Um, that's what we are going to do. I'm gonna copy the code. <laughs> it's already there. I'm just gonna make sure that this is. So let's let's explain the code a little bit. Okay. As you may know, Plone has adapters. Right, right? yes. So so Kilotina has adapters too. It's the same, the same thing. It's the same uh, same, the same concept. Same concept, exactly. So we have this, this adapter for AI conversation that what it does, it provides uh, this, this, um, this schema and the factory that, that we are using. So by, co by calling super, we are calling all the fields that the serializer has by default. But at the same time now, here we are adding more fields. Okay, okay. now that, that's because that's because all the objects are stored as JSON in Postgres. Is that right? No, they are pickles. So, oh, I mean, yeah, we have the JSON B that allows you to search, but I believe that what we save into the database are pickles. Okay. So, so we actual P code of the objects. Yeah. Yeah. You got the pickle of the object. So what you do at the end is to serialize the pickle. That's what, this is what Guillotina is doing here. Okay. This is what default JSON summary serializer is doing at the end of the day. So by doing this, what we are doing is to add these three fields here in the serializer. And the same from message. We are adding the text and the author. Now, again, 
I've got to add this in the init file. That's called serialized, okay. right? Yeah, that's called serialized. That's all for the, for the for the serializers. Now, let's jump to services. Services are like endpoints or views in other languages. Guillotina has endpoints as well, right? So mm -hmm. first, let's copy the code and then let's um, let's explain. Which is already created. Okay, let's analyze the code. What's happening here? So by defining this with this decorator configure services, we are defining at the context of the container. We are saying, okay, we have the endpoint conversations, and this is to differentiate to the to, to a real object. Okay, so what's happening when we call co conversations in the container? What it does? It's in the same container. It gets the folder that the add-on just created for us, that's called conversations, gets the user that's making the request. Right, okay. And what it's doing, it's looping over all the conversations that are inside of the folder conversations. Okay. Okay? Right. Asynchronously. And yeah, exactly, asynchronously. And what it does, it's if users, if user ID that is making the the request, it's inside of the conversation. It's it's part of the conversation. It's the member of the conversation. It's right. summary. It it serializes the the conversation, and it saves in a list. So it's looping over all the conversations. Okay, it's serializing the conversation, and it's returning the whole conversation that the user is making the the request. It's part of the conversation. It's part of it. This is what, what this loop is doing. Again, goes through um, uh, all the commas. Is it, there the concept of snooping and snarping in Guillotina that there is in? I had, OK, a um, little history. You know, I'm a patent attorney too, right? I write patents for companies. Mm -hmm. All right, and so I was writing a patent for Hewlett Packard, and it was on. Um, so there's what is called data localization. So you could have different cores, different different chunks. Well, the same chunk of a database for being operated by four different cores. And so, if the if one core updated the database it would send a signal on the data bus and say, hey, I'm just, I'm updating this set of the database. And then the other cores would snarf that data and then, then do a read to get the most update up to date data. All right. Yeah. So that's called snooping and snarfing. Is there a concept like that in here where yeah. the data, is, so one process is doing something with a chunk of data and then that data gets changed and, and otherwise, you know, a, a late running process could get old data. Yeah, the, the key point here, Ron, is that guillotine is transactional. It means that it means that uh, every request that you are doing, it opens a, a transaction with the database. And if something happens, it goes and goes back. The state of the object will not be changed. Right. There's you've got the atomic that's, condition, that's, right? Yeah, that, that, that's what you are saying that, for instance, if I open a request, and it's doing a, transac a tra transaction and it changed an object and it's changing an object. If you try to change this object, Ilotina will say, hey, no, this object is being changed right now. This object cannot well, be changed. Well, yeah, that, right. I'm sure there's data concurrency, but what I'm saying is because of the async, all right, that let's just, let's take the example, all right? So I go in and, and I have an async request to go in and get a chunk mm -hmm. of data and then do some things with it, right? And that do uh -huh. some things with it takes time, but it's yeah. done asynchronously, right? So I got some data at a first time, and then in the interim, while this while that first process is running, the data underlying it gets changed. Yeah, the, but, but there, are, there, are, there, are, yeah, I understand your question. There are two different things here. So for this being asynchronous is one thing. That means that 
if there is another request that is requesting another object, that request will not be blocked. Okay? Right, I get that. that, that's, I, yeah. that that's the right thing. But what you are saying is that, for instance, if we are looping over this and there is another request that tries to change this, it will say that it's, it's blocked, that the transaction is going on. So it will say, try again. Okay, so will, that's how it, 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 so it doesn't yeah. even try, it doesn't try to go through. So the first one can be a read, which is no big deal, but the second one would be a write. And because there's a read going on, it won't allow a write. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. The point okay. here is that guillotine is transactional. This is this is the key of it. So if you when you do a request, you open a, a transaction to the database. Right? See, right. if you do another request and this transaction goes to the same object, it it then it will say that it's invalid. Right, so that, that's at, at the guillotine, database level. Yeah, Guillotina yep. tries, to, tries to do it again. I think that it tries to do it three times. Okay. I'm not sure, but I, I think three times. But it's transactional. It means that Guillotina always makes sure that if something gets changed, it gets changed uh, for real. Right, right, right. It's an atomic operation. So uh, this, this loop here, this loop, it's not bad. But if you have a lot of data here, I will say to not do that. Not do that, not uh, to do this kind of loop. Imagine that you, that you have 1 million of conversation here. Right. Then I will not do that. What I will do instead is to make a search in the catalog. I oh, will okay. use Elasticsearch or Postgres to do, the, to do the search. Not I wouldn't do this, but for this case, it's fine. I mean, if you have 1,000 objects, it doesn't happen. Big deal, issue. right. Yeah, but if you have 1 million, maybe yes, it will take a lot of time. And that's not good. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I get it. Thank you. Yeah. So what it's doing, it's looping over all the conversation that exists in the folder conversations and, and serializing them and returning them. Right. It's like right. kind of a summary, a summary of a conversation, you say. And the same from the messages inside of a conversation here. You can call, we can call the messages and it will, uh, serialize all the messages of the conversation and it will, it will return them sorted by the creation date. All right. So now we have to add services as well. Services. And here it's explaining how to search with, which I explained before. Okay, so now let's let's test these uh, new endpoints that we have here. So we have buff conversation, right? Now buff, let's write some messages. Type message with the text buff message, and I will delete the ID. Oh, because you're going to let it just give an ID or? Yeah, yeah. So Bob creates now kind of a lot of messages, okay? A lot of messages. Now, let's call messages, all right? Let's call this endpoint and see what, what happens. So what has happened is that, can you see? Mm. All the messages are returned, all right? With the creation date, date and text and author, do you remember that we put that in the serializer? Right. And they are ordered by date. Can you see it? Mm -hmm. 35, 36, 37, many, yeah. 37. So that's just what the endpoint has done. It loops over all the messages in the conversation, serialize them and return them. So the so whatever type of object that we create is always going to have an at message or at whatever that type is? Yeah, because can you see it here that you see it here where the context is I conversation? Right, messages. So you are saying, yeah, okay. so you are saying every object, every context that is a conversation will have this endpoint. And <laughs> you, you can delete the context if you want. And then all the objects will have this endpoint, but it will fail. Oh yeah, that would be a mess. <laughs> and the same for the conversation, where the where the context is the container. 
we can do we can do that and what it does it's get the conversation folder and loop over the conversation folder so if we go to the to the container and we do conversations here you'll get all the conversations which we only have one yeah because bob bob has only created one conversation right because this here it takes into account the users that are inside of the conversation if the user is not inside of the conversation it will not return it this is the the if cool we've learned a lot of things yeah this is good though this is actually more than i was hoping for i this is wow. this is really yeah because yeah that 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 like that the name the ad message or whatever i that's going to be extremely helpful to me because <laughs> cool. then i can go in and do a search for when i'm in an object i can do the search for yeah, like yeah. if i'm in an opinion note i can do a search for the judge or whatever yeah 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 yeah, yeah for sure you, you can do that now let's jump to async utilities all right Mm -hmm. ba basically, an async utility is an object that is instantiated with an async function at the beginning, uh, from precisely on the sync event loop. That means that when guillotina runs, it's started. There are a sets of utilities by default and some that you can define. So when you start guillotina, all these utilities will be run, will be executed asynchronously. All right. Mm -hmm. um, that's really helpful for long running tasks that you want to run at the beginning and you want to have some some code that, that does something in the beginning of, of the execution. In this case, we are going to copy this utility and we are going we're going through it later. So we have this, this utility here. Okay, now for the utilities, they should have an initialize method because Guillotina, when it starts this utility, it will automatically run this, this coroutine here. All right? Mm -hmm. What it does, this, this coroutine here, it starts a queue and a synchronous queue, all right? And it says, if it's not closed, what it does, it's to get the element from the queue with a timeout. This, I think you wait for, it's a timeout. If this timeout is raised and nothing happens, um, we, the exception will be catch here. Okay. All right? And what it does is it gets the element of the queue, that the element of the queue is a message and summary okay we'll see more about that later but basically uh the one that puts something to the queue is this curating here this curating what it does is you pass the object message serialize it and put it in the queue a tuple of the object and the summary serialized all right so here when you get it we get the message that's the object the summary that's the serialization of the object. Then we check every WebSocket that we have in the web services because this utility is intended to be used as a WebSocket to send okay. messages as a WebSocket. Right. Okay. So it says, well, if the user, if the user ID, if I'm it's not mistaken, right? Yeah. If the, if the conversation, can you look at that parent? You see here. We have the object message, so the parent will be a conversation. Right. This is like going one one down in the traversal. Well, is it going one up in the traversal? Yeah, one up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, yeah. I, I see the the other way, but yeah, one up. Yes, yes. You go to the, one up to the container. Yeah, right. exactly. Yeah, exactly. Because yeah, 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 exactly. That's, so, what, that's exactly the way it works in Zoe. Yeah, so it's exactly the same. So you get the users that, that we have in the conversation and we look for the users that are there. We look over them. Then we look over the, the web sockets that we have. And if the web socket was created by the same user that is in the conversation, then we send the message to the web socket. 
okay? So okay. what it's doing it is sending messages to the web socket and take into account that this is in a loop. This is a loop that never stops. So the, the, that will send messages always, all right? We have two methods here, that it's to register the web socket and to unregister the web socket. And we have finally the routine to send the message. That's the utility itself, okay? Let's leave it here. Let's just add it here again. That utility will run when we start the guillotine automatically, all right? Mm -hmm. Now, we need to load this utility and that's loaded using the config. That makes, yeah, load utilities. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, you load the utility, right? And you can right. do it here in the app settings or you can do it in the config.yaml. It doesn't matter. In this tutorial, they, uh, it's written here, but just for the sake of, of knowing that this can be done in the config.yaml as well, right? And what yep. do we do here? We say, it, okay, load utilities. Uh, I want to load this utility that's called message sender. All right. And here we provide the, the schema that is in the utility. And this is the factory. This is where the logic is. Because if you look at the utility, we defined the interface here. You see it? That inherits from iAsync utility. That that one it's the one that defines the initialize method, Keratin. So basically what we do is to load the utility here. Saying guillotina, hey, I want to load this, this utility with that name. Mm -hmm. And this is the factory. This is the, the logic and this is the interface. All right? You're right. The factory, is the, same, the, the factory is the same concept as is in Zope, right? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so that's all, all right. And the settings here, you that's could still a good bit. That's variables. not just all. <laughs> that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's amazing. Utilities are really, are really useful, and you can pass some variables here. I don't know. Yeah, those are like default. Yeah, sure. Yeah, you you could do that, and then in your utility here, you will you will have them here as as the settings. All right. Right. It doesn't matter. I can leave that here because we are not using them. Right. Okay, cool. So now we are gonna, uh, in order to send messages. So the, the point here is that when we create the message object, we want to send this message to the WebSocket, right? So mm -hmm. we need to call the utility. We need to use the utility, right? So in order to do that, we, we will go to the subscribers again and we'll add another subscriber. That, take a look at that. The subscriber triggers when the message is created. All right? Mm -hmm. Now, can you see that my Emacs is saying that I'm missing my message? That's because it's not imported. I have to do it here. It's a four underscore? Uh, what, excuse me? You have a four under on the, uh, the on the configure dot subscriber is a four underscore. Uh, here you mean? No, no. Uh, yeah, up above. Well, uh, the uh, you got ag yeah. There you go on that line. There's a four underscore. Is that correct? Four underscore. The I oh yeah, 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 yeah. It is. It is. It is. Okay. It is. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's like that. Okay. Because it's so. No, it's because for not put four. Do not put the, the same. Right, yeah, that would four. be, yeah, I can imagine get a compiler error, yeah. Well, I mean, I, it's just that choice of word, though, because that's a. Yeah, well, it's saying. It's yeah, saying that, it's well, that's a reserved word in Python, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I'm missing the get utility. Oh, another thing that is important. Um, utilities are singletons. Okay. Okay. That means that if you, um, in order to get the, the utility, you use the method get utility. All right. Okay. So this utility is a singleton. It means that if, well, if, in, if in another part of the code 
you get the utility, then you will have the single token. Oh, is it a namespace right. issue? Excuse me? Is you it a the, namespace you, issue or what? No, 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 no. It's because utilities are designed to be single single objects in the whole system. That means well, like, I, imagine I, that. I mean, just, okay, you got, oh. Because imagine, imagine that you want to know, that you want to know how many web sockets you have registered. Right, you right. need to have the single object, right? You need to have the singleton in order to do that. So the utilities are always singleton objects. Okay. All right. So if right, I do that right, and I yeah, get the I, utility here, uh, it's going yeah, to be the my, same object. Right. Well, my I'm sorry. My confusion came was you had get utility. You had utility that component. You got get utility, but you had chat dot utility had didn't have the get utility, which is where I, you, I at least intuitively where you probably would have expected it. You no, well, no, I, yeah, no I, I see where you're coming from. I just, it just, when I saw that, it's like, wait, what, you know? And, yeah, it's that, it's, it's the interface here. Right, yeah, right. And that's see? that's in the component. Yeah. Right, and that and that's that's where it should be. I, I just, when I saw that, I first like, like, wait. <laughs> yeah, yeah, utility, that's two different lines and yeah. Yeah, it is here. Right. Import it from yeah. here, and then you use this method to in order to get the, the utility. Well, the right, but the, that comes from a different. That comes from the utility component. Yeah, exactly. That's the utility right. component, and that's uh, the interface that they, the utility that you want to. to right, right. right. Yeah. I, yeah, but you had the guillotine underscore chat dot utility. Yeah. But you had your get utility from a different, I, and that that when I just saw that, it just like that that, that, was, that was confusing. Huh? But, but, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, okay, yeah. I just like yeah, I agree on that. I agree on that. Okay, so now that we have our utility, what we do here, if you we send the message, and see the message here, it's the object. So what we do is to serialize the object, we serialize the object, and to put it into the queue, put the object on the summary. All right. Okay. So now we are using the G to send the message. Okay. Next one. Web sockets. So Kilotina out of the box uh, allows to to use web sockets. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's let's copy that. Let's copy that first. And let's explain. Well, it's already there because. But basically, what it does. Um, Guillotina is built using ASCII. A ASCII. I don't know. I don't know how to pronounce it in English. ASCII. ASCII. Yeah. A S C I I. So, right. Yeah. A A S G I. C I I. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it's an acronym, and yeah, but it's pronounced in English. It's pronounced pronounced ASCII. ASCII. Yeah. So it's built on top of ASCII. So that's crazy. I mean, I, it's not U T F eight or anything like that. <laughs> Um, well, I, I Jordi Masip knows more about me about this uh, kind of topic. That's the one that's it's maintaining Guillotina. Okay. But out of the box, we can have web sockets. But just with the request, just do that, get uh, uh, double BS, and then we prepare the socket. And look, look here, we get the utility, we register the web socket, and we don't do anything else. We just look over the messages, but here we don't do anything because this only send only uh, sends messages. It does not receive any messages to WebSocket. Does that make sense? Yeah. No. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, so now, I mean, it, it's basically it's it's a it's a nice benign way to do it. Yeah. And here, again. For our web socket. Now, how do we how do we use uh, web sockets in Guillotina? The secret, it it needs to be generated, and Guillotina has a way to generate them that it's invoke this comment here. We need to grab that. We need to go to the config file. Oh, and add the secret. We do that. Yeah. We add the secret here. Why is it GWK? JWK. <laughs> um, JSON web token, that means. 
Oh, okay. Okay. So like that. So that could be our secret that the web uh, socket is gonna be used. Now let's start that. Let's start our application. Okay. Now that's now. where you had to start it and restart it again though. Yeah, I have to. Yeah, I have to stop it and restart because it. Because you you changed change the something. config file and there's no yeah, yeah there's no I auto think, restart on config changing the config uh, file. I think that there is a watch watch how is that called watchdog? I think I've seen it, but I've never used it. Yeah, yeah, no, that's I've okay. I wouldn't. It. I wouldn't. I, I look. Yeah, I I don't Very trust that and much. Flask so. are all the same way. Yeah, they they have it. So now, if we want to have a token, WebSocket token, the only thing that we have to do is to get to this endpoint. Okay. Now, we will have this token here. All right. Yep. So now, there is a there is a, a JavaScript here script that uh, that does that basically. So it opens a WebSocket and and connects to the server. But I have a Python. I created a Python one because. I like Python more in than Python, right? Yeah, I've done it in Python, and I've done something like that. Where okay. here? Oh, I'm missing something. I'm missing something. I'm missing the endpoint conversate. Or no, I did it right. Subscribers. Yeah, I'm missing one one endpoint. That actually where to query, where to uh, make the. That's actually, no no no, it's that, it's that one. Can you see that here, we create a service when we define the WebSocket, we created a service, all right? That's called okay. Conversate. Okay. Yeah. So, if you take a look to the Python, to the Python that I made here. Okay, please. That one. I'm going to make it bigger. So, what do we do here? It's like when there is a message, we decode. We just print the message. Okay, that's to make it to make it beautiful. Or all these JSON loads and JSON dumps is to make it more uh, more beautiful. And if you take a look here, what we do is to open a web socket, a client web socket, to the conversate. Right. This is where we have to find the service with the WebSocket plus the token here. Right. Okay. Yeah, I mean that makes sense. Yeah. So now, if I open another terminal, I will open a normal one now. And I go to the. Um, No, let's go. And then I execute this uh, Python. What it's gonna be is to connect to the to the WebSocket. All right, yeah. with the new token I just generated. And it should print the message. The WebSocket should print the message here. Right, but I mean, just out of curiosity, oh. you're, you're using Python 3, right? Yeah. Okay, you just set yours oh. to default to Python 3? Yeah. I I have Python three dot eight. Right. Okay. Can you see here that it takes expired token? So I have to generate a new one. Right. Oh, yeah. How long does the token last? Well, if you stop the guillotine and start it again, the token. Oh right. Yeah. Works. Absolutely. Sure. Yes. So I have to have to change it again. Change the token here. So I do it, and I execute the. Oh, there's something wrong. Expired token. Maybe I'm not running. Am I running the correct file? Let's see. No, that's not the same file. Can you see it? Oh, I didn't yeah, save I... it. Probably I didn't save it. Well, the token looks the same. Does it? No. It's not the same. It ends. 9x8, and this yeah. does not expire. Oh, X, yeah. Right. 
So. Do you want to generate a new token or? No, it's because. Tutorial, can you see a chat? Oh, see, I, I was using. I was using the wrong the wrong file. Is that? Expired again. Now, yeah, yes. Now it's expired. Let's try again. Yeah, that's the that's yet a different token, right? All right. Now let me do. Yeah, it's the same. Save yes. the file. Now it should work. Yeah, right. Yeah, now okay. it's connected. Okay. Maybe you have so to save I... the file or something. Yeah, 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 exactly. I was I was uh, executing another file. So now the, the WebSocket is connected, right? Yeah. So now what will happen is that when I create a conversation, I a message. If we go to the um, to the services, no, to the subscribers, sorry. So when I create a message, what it will do. So now we have registered our WebSocket. So the utility, what it will do, it's to send the message to the WebSocket because it will queue the message. Then this loop here, it will get the message and send it. Let's try it. Let's try it. And I will do something, I will do something else. I will drag that then here. I will put it there and I will put it there. So now let's go to the conversation. Conversations and Bob folder. Hmm. And then here, let's create a message. Yeah, not that one. So when I post it, what uh, folder does not exist? Oh, how was that called? Well, I don't remember the name of the folder that, that Bob, well, let's create another folder. It's fine. Let's create another folder. Let's create another conversation with the ID. I ah, it was Bob conversation. <laughs> okay. We will see that now. If I post it, it will be created. Yeah, exactly. Okay. It's Bob conversation and message without ID, let's not create without ID. And the text, let's put hello website. Now if I create it, can, did you see it? Yeah, I see it. That the, that the utility send the message to the WebSocket? Right, so now the WebSocket can go in and, or the trigger, essentially it sets the trigger going. Yeah. Or whatever you want. It, it, but the event gets recorded. Yeah, the event gets recorded. So the point is that is, is that is the record of the trigger. Like I, I mean, in a sense, one of the, I guess one of the things that, that kind of begs the question is: Do you always have to have that kind of trigger or or the thing watching for the triggers on all the time, or can that be can the events be stored uh, somewhere um, in the database and then a cron job run to go get them? and then do accordingly? Yeah, you can create a, a cron job, but I, I will say that that's too complicated. Oh, I mean, okay. <laughs> uh, I, will then, I will then do that. Okay. Because now so it's really- No, that, that, I mean, coming from- Yeah, yeah, we, we, you, you, can, you can do that if you want. I mean, no, no, actually, well, I, some, some of the things, some of the things, some of the jobs and stuff are pretty big that you would run and run overnight. The point is that the utility, it's, it's really good to do that because you can have this always running here and yeah. you have control over it because you can get the utility and you, and you can get the web sockets that are registered, that aren't registered. So you have control over it and always in okay. your code. 
Right. So yeah. you go okay. to your subscribers and you said, okay, just when the message is sent, just when the message is sent, it's really, it's really powerful because you don't have to say to look like a cron job that looks for the messages that have been added. No, no, it's just use the subscriber, the subscriber use the utility and the utility automatically does the job for you. You don't have to do the code here in the event. It's the utility that automatically does it for you. And that's really powerful. That's really powerful. That's really powerful. Yeah. And that, that will be more or less the majority of almost all the things that Kinotina can do. So if we, if we um, take a look at who just have seen here. So kind of a lot of things, huh? I mean, you have seen that piece by piece, we have constructed a really powerful application with subscribers, with endpoints, with uh, serializers, uh, with new users that can, that, that can log in with the permissions and the security of the users only can, that can only see the conversation that they have created or that they are part of it. Uh, well, uh, it's powerful. Are the, are the users stored in like an ACL a la Zope style or what? Yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of ACL. Okay. See that the the, the permissions it's ACL. Right. Yeah. But I mean, the only what you save actually, it's the permissions on, in the same object. I mean, the access, the roles that have access, all the sharing that that I that I show you here, the sharing, that, mm -hmm. that's the important thing. Right. The sharing it's it's really important. So I hope that with this, I've given you enough background or context to see what Guillotina can do at what yeah. we, what we can achieve. That it's almost everything. For instance, I will not buy an applications. I will not buy an application with Guillotina that it's an e-commerce. I will not do that because, for instance, every product. Hold it, hold it. You would not buy a guillotine. What now? Say that again. Okay. I will not buy a product that it's based in an e-commerce okay. with guillotine. I will not do that. I will use Django instead. But why? Because the traversal in this kind of, of cases, where there are a lot of relationships, where there are a lot, a lot of cases, where there are a lot of uh, SQL relationship, hard relationships, then Django, I will use Django, for instance. Okay. But for another kind of application where the hierarchy and the permissions are really important, or you have different kind of users, or the roles are well defined for the users that, that you have, then I will use Guillotine. Okay. Right? So yeah. for, for instance, we have a project at Isco that it's called Learning by Docs, and we have uh, um, students, professors, administrators, and another, another kind of roles. And it's really powerful because with Kilotina you can define the roles of these of these uh, use cases of these um, stakeholders, and then you can define the permissions. You can define the permissions that that have access to the objects, and that's really powerful. I will have a lot of problems to do that in Django, for instance, mm -hmm. or a project that has a tree structure, kind of objects that that needs to be hierarchical and the URL has to map in a very specific way to the object, then I would use Guillotine. So, well, we, we have uh, seen a lot of what Guillotine can do. And there are a lot of things that still can do. Uh, for instance, on Monday, I'm gonna talk how to integrate Elasticsearch, how to integrate Gcloud, and how to integrate Stripe with Stripe so it's a methodology to pay to buy right. products on the internet. Elastic, you know Elastic? Yep. And Gcloud. So instead of saving the blobs in the Postgres, we save it in the Gcloud in a bucket but that Guillotina creates automatically and maps all the URL, all the structure, the URL structure um, to finally write to the file. 
So that's it. That's it. Um, hope about, that if you, you have any questions or something, just, just ask. I mean, yeah, well, I was going to say, how would you link uh, Elasticsearch to Yotina? That's really easy. Really? Yeah, it's really easy. I can show you an example. So you, let's suppose that we have an Elasticsearch running already uh, our, and you have access to this, to this, um, to this the, the service, um, right? The service over yeah. port. Yeah. So let's go to. Let me just search. I had it here somewhere. And what is things here? Tina training. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Well, this is familiar to you, right? Right, what, yes, what, yes, the YAML, yes. Yeah, let's config YAML, right? That, that sounds familiar to you. So look, the only thing that you have to do if you have access to Elasticsearch is to add this piece of code here. Oh, yeah, okay. That's all. You say, okay, just uh, give me an index for the prefix that you want. That that can be the, the one that you want. Right. See, local, local host. Right, just give it the, yeah, the give it the you are right. That's giving the configuration of the sniper timeout, the sniper start, and just give it that's that by default. Just copy that here. By the by the way, then, that's that's pronounced sniffer. Sniffer. Okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. Sniffer. Sniffer? Sniffer, yeah. It's 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 okay. Sniff. <laughs> With your nose. Then, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then you just load the utility. We, you you've seen that before, right? Yes. Where yes, when you, you did have that. You did, right. So yeah, the, the Elastic Search has its own has its own uh, utility that it's done for you. You don't have to do anything. Okay, so well, that's easy. With that, you have an Elastic Search. Every time that you create an object, it will be indexed in the in the Elastic Search. Okay, so if so it begs the next question is, uh, you know, does if that's in there, does you do you still get a catalog index in Postgres that you can search independently? No. No, no. it's one or the other. No. Yeah, it's one or the other. I mean, you could you could um, then you have to modify the code inside, and then you you have to make some changes. But it's one or the other. By default, it's one or the that's other. That's fine. That's okay. I just need to know if it's yeah. You go yeah. step off it's that abyss, and you're in it. Yeah. Do you want to test that? Uh, yeah. Well, actually, the, the question is: Do the uh, does the syntax for the URL the question after the question mark uh, change to do automatically change to an Elasticsearch Elasticsearch uh, syntax? So you mean the search endpoint here that we were using before? Right. Exactly. The at search. No, it does not. It that's the kind of the magic that we tried out. All the APIs have the same. Have the same convention, so no, it will not change. You use the search, and oh, I mean, there's automatically some things, it will use Elasticsearch. Right. Some things you can do in Elasticsearch that you can't do in the catalog. Yeah, of course, that's true. right. So, if but you the keep main the things, things yeah. Well, sorry, yeah. So, I mean, the question that's, is, we want that. I mean, that's why you want Elasticsearch, is so you can actually do that extra stuff. Yeah, and you can do that extra stuff. Actually. Okay, but it's more complicated. The, the syntax is more complicated. Yes. But, I will right. tell you something. If mm. you can do your own your own parcel, because actually what that's doing when you do a search, right? When you do a search and you do a type name, is there is a program here? There is an endpoint. What what does it take the tape name tape name and and creates a query to Elasticsearch, builds the query of Elasticsearch and send it. You can do that yourself, and that's what we do in one of our projects. Okay. We we have our own parcel and we do a lot of things there. I mean, everything. I mean, you can do everything. If you construct uh, the query, you can do almost everything, but you have to change the parser. That's the one that takes the, the request here and, and turn it into something different. Okay. If you want to know more on, on Monday, I'm going to explain that. I'm going to explain oh, how to- Oh, to yeah. Do. Okay. All right. If you can, yeah. I mean, for you just to know, uh, we're going to record it, I think. It's on so. the Monday, yeah, it's on. Yeah, I think I'm going to. I already said it. I was going to attend that. I'm going to attend all the guillotine ones. 
Okay, cool. Cool. Yeah. So yeah, no, it's really easy. It's low code because you don't have to do anything. You just introduce that to your company. Right. Yeah. yeah. Yours is at yours is at eight fifty five Central Time, so it'd be fourteen something your time. Fourteen fifty five your time. Yeah, I think I have to I have to check it, but yes, I think you're you're on the you're the you're after the keynote on track two. Yeah, I have to take a look at the time because now I don't remember. If you yeah, see, well, you I, see it's that, an, that's, it's that's, right at the well. The keynote starts at thirteen hundred, and so it's at fourteen fifty five. Yeah. Or yeah, no, thirteen fifty five. I'm sorry, thirteen fifty five. Yeah. Well, so um, that will be it. Thank you. Thank you that very much. That, that, yeah. That. Now, um, just I'm offering, since I'm a lawyer and do like wording a lot, obviously, uh, if you want me to help you with the wording to tweak your documentation about linking into uh, Postgres, yes. I'm happy to help you with that. Okay. So if you go to... You can you can open an issue if you want. That, okay. I think that that will be the best way to do it because right. Not, okay, that's fine. I'll just handle it through the GitHub way. That that's fine. I'll do that. I've got yeah. a GitHub account. Yeah, C okay. create an issue and that's completely fine. And we'll track from there. And I will add this this Docker I this Postgres thing to your documentation. Right. Okay. Very good. Then I will uh, I'll do that and. Um... Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Well, well thank you very much. Um, uh, where are you located? I'm near Barcelona. Okay. Yeah. 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 Our uh, my law firm had a, a, a facility at a office in Milano. Oh. Okay. Yeah. It, uh, it was headquartered in München, Germany, Deutschland. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know. I'm sorry. I don't know how to say German and Italian. Uh, <laughs> Me neither. Yeah. <laughs> Me neither. So, so no worry. Well, what do you call Germany? What do you call Deutschland? Deutschland. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, that's, yeah, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. Deutschland. Deutschland. There's yeah. a funny story about that in America. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Tell me. There was a whole community of Germans in Pennsylvania, which is a state in the US. And, uh, it, it was at a time when, you know, people were large, it was, you know, hundreds of years ago. Anyway, mm -hmm. they, they came to settle and uh, they, uh, so the, they settled there in Pennsylvania and the, the locals there asked the Germans, you know, how do you refer to yourself? And they said, you know, we're to Deutsch. And, and, <laughs> and, right. And so the locals said, oh, Dutch, as in like the <laughs> Netherlands. Right. So they, they <laughs> they became the Pennsylvania Dutch. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's a really good one. Yeah. Uh, yeah only in America. I, well, yeah. Yeah. So, it's, well run. It was very nice meeting you. Yeah. The same. And, I can say uh, the same. Okay. And the I will, I guess I'll, we'll, I'll, I'll hear your conversation tomorrow and, and more. And, uh, do you know uh, uh, David Bain? No. Oh, all right. He's in Jamaica. He's he's a developer. Uh, he's in this space. But yeah. Uh, so yeah, uh, it's funny. I I was surprised that you'd never heard of Alan Union. So I'm I'm getting old. That's that's clearly what the I'm. I'm <laughs> wow. Okay. Well, anyway, it was very nice meeting you. Take care. Have a good day, and uh, we'll talk yeah, again too. later. Yeah. Sure. You too. Bye-bye. 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 How do you...